everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Min Max Show podcast, place about games, friends, and getting better. I'm Ben Hanson, and I'm thanking you for being here. I'm joined by Jacob Geller. Hello. Joined by Haley McLean. So soon. Mm-hmm. That's hello and simlish. Thank you. We're getting to that. Uh, we're joined by Sarah Podzorski. Hello. Could you please address uh, your tweet saying that Kirby doesn't belong in Smash? Whoa. Ooh. Okay. Can you please address all, your controversial tweet first from this all, morning, it's Ben? Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge, Sorry, Jigglypuff. huge difference. Although, is there really? Cool. I was just <gasps> thinking about it. This is like uh, Min Max's Twitter account is a great place for random thoughts that I don't want to blast on my own Twitter account. Of just like it is. It's just weird that for the original Smash Brothers, that Jigglypuff made that cut. Like I like Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff was the funniest part of that first season of the show. There's no doubt with her getting angry all the time and drawing in people's faces, but. In the history of Nintendo, for Jigglypuff to be in top eight was like, it's, it's odd. And then I feel like she was kind of grandfathered in beyond that. Like now, you look at the entire roster, even now, I think it would be absurd to include Jigglypuff. But Jigglypuff's maybe, like the girl Pikachu. Like that's yeah, who I thought was the main character. I traded all my cards to my brother for Jigglypuff. So I was obsessed Jigglypuff with Jigglypuff. was the Eevee before we had Eevee, and the, Nintendo yeah. officially said, this is the girl Pikachu. Yeah, honestly, that's what it is. It's like, it, we- it feels more weird in retrospect because I feel like they pivoted and they're like, okay, Eevee is number two for first generation, no matter what. And Jigglypuff, I guess, if you're a big fan of Misty in the show, I guess it's fine. I feel like you're missing the... They already built a ball for Kirby. They were just yeah. like, what's another ball character? <laughs> I think you're probably, probably like, right. But we don't even need to change the color. I think there's something <laughs> to that for sure. Hey, well, good news. We're going to be talking about Pokemon Red on this very episode of the podcast a little bit later. Haley mclean has been playing it, and I'm very curious to hear all about it. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about Elden Ring. Jacob and Sarah have gone back to the well of the, what's the well called in, in Elden Ring? The Ofra. Shifra? That one. Who knows? Going we're back, back in to the it. building. Hell yeah. Here we uh, go again. We're going to be talking about Nintendo Indie World, some of the announcements that were super exciting from that on Wednesday. Then, for explaining Haley's slip of the tongue, uh, we're going to be talking about The Sims 1. Uh, I don't know why, but I cannot wait to talk about Sims 1. Uh, Jacob Geller, you've played a game called Children of the Sun. I've played a little bit too. That's right. It, it seems up your alley. I want to talk all about it. Talking about Yellow Taxi Goes Room, back half of this uh, podcast is all about community comments and questions and why stuff from the community here. And speaking about the community, I want to plug this thing real quick at the top. Um, we launched something on Monday, which is truly an adventure in the making, where we posted on Patreon and said, hey, we're going to, as many people as want to from the MinMax group, we're all going to fly to a location and have our next big community meetup the big community meetup to celebrate five years of MinMax. So this will be like this fall, right? Um, but the catch is we don't know where we're going to be flying to at this point. So if you're a Patreon supporter at any tier, we have a post up now where you can make the pitch for your hometown. And then a bunch of us are going to fly there and we're going to make a travel log about the entire experience of us living in a wacky house or a wacky hotel and seeing the sights and sounds of this small town. And here's how it's going to work. We have like 137 people that have made pitches for their hometown so far. We're going to narrow it down to like five pretty soon and then let people vote on Patreon. And that will determine where we're all going to fly to uh, this September. And I don't want to tell people what to do, but I will say the number of people that are in there like, come to Los Angeles. Then they sit back. No, like we're looking, <laughs> we're looking for smaller, more interesting, quirky places. Make the pitch for like why this is a good contender for us to I film saw a travel. So many log. Minneapolis. <laughs> I know. It's like L.A., Minneapolis, L.A., Minneapolis. I should just go in there and delete those. With all the while respecting the hell out of those community members. But I saw a couple. Listen, Ben wants to double the population of a town. Yes. Like I know <laughs> that that's your goal. It really is. I think it would be the most fun. Like, you know, I grew up in a town, well, outside of a town of like 900 people. But I'm like, man, if we could go to like a town like that where everything's cheap and we could really wring the most out of this small town, not tear it apart at the seams, but just like have a community meetup and just like make some small town bars year by just packing this place full i think that sounds like so much fun and so i'm looking forward to seeing all those pitches i was like we're gonna do a stream where we go through all the contenders and kind of try to narrow it down a little bit but i've seen a couple so far like one of them was like like hey um 
I know somebody who owns the movie theater, and so we could just rent out the movie theater and watch a movie or play games on that with the community. Oh, and it's like, ooh, that's, that's very awesome. good. Like that type of pitch, I feel like is sweet. But Sarah, do you have any tips for people when they're pitching their hometown for the next meetup? Um, yeah, Ben really likes movies. So talk <laughs> uh-huh. about your movie theaters a lot. Right, um, smart. Talk about like the talk about the weird food your yes. town probably has. Yes, yes. Because Ben also really likes weird food shots. Sure. <laughs> Oh, just so I can, like, win the travelogue, I can shove a camera in yeah, someone's face. Yeah, you can face. zoom in on someone eating it. Yeah. I mean, that sounds great to me. That sounds like cinema, as far as I can tell. But, you know, the part that I geek out about probably too much is thinking, like, who still hasn't met each other at MinMax? Like, Jacob is probably the biggest outlier for people don't know if he's a physical being. Yeah, it turns out I'm 6'5". God damn, congratulations. That's great. Uh, so again, patreon.com, uh, submit your hometown, make the case, uh, and give us the adventure of our lifetimes this fall. Um, one thing, I'd argue the main thing we're talking about in this episode of the podcast, I didn't mention before, because it's too big. It's too big to comprehend. But we're thinking about what would be a fun theme for an episode for the podcast. Um, and I pitched, what about we talk about software? Not video game software, but our favorite software of all time, throughout our personal lives, which software has really tickled us? And if I had to reenact Sarah's reaction to that pitch, it was, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. You specifically said, Sarah, I was thinking about you for this one, and I I have been, that has been sitting and hanging <laughs> over my head for the past few days, because for the life of me, I cannot figure out what I and software have in common. I'll tell you, you know what it is? I connect you with a software kind of person because your streaming interface is like you with Windows 95, like very mm-hmm. specific. It's like, okay, software right oh. there, Sarah. I'd argue you use software every day. And then the third reason is, what was it when I was talking about Notion, doing a plug for Notion? A couple months ago on the podcast, you're like, I love Notion. And so in my mind, you're like, Miss Software USA. I do use software every day. (laughs) All right. Try and deny it. So we've all compiled uh, our top three most impactful, favorite pieces of software throughout our entire lives. And if you think this is too geeky, you came to the wrong place. But if you do think it's too geeky, there's timestamps below. So you can jump right to the Elden Ring talk and we won't judge you. I can't even see those analytics when you do them. Um, Okay. Haley, do you want to kick this off? Throw sure. something out there. Uh, LimeWire. I was a big LimeWire user. Yeah. In middle school. And it was funny. I was talking to my partner about this because I was like, oh, what's, what are some software you like? And I was like, I think I'll, like, I'll probably say LimeWire. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, I have so many horror stories trying to download a song off LimeWire. Then you open it. It's something something very inappropriate and i was like am i the only kid that never happened to like every time i downloaded a song on limewire it was the song i wanted and that was totally <laughs> fine and i remember putting in all the effort to make the playlist you had to sit down with your notes and like download each and every song to move it over to your ipod to bring it to school the next day like that was such an effort mm-hmm. and i remember certain songs would have like Whoever was the one who uploaded it would sometimes just yell their DJ name in the middle of a song. <laughs> Do you remember this? <laughs> no, then, I never had that. And then there was like it, years later, you just think that's part of the song. And I, what was I listening to? I think it was like Beautiful Girl. And the guy who the the version I had of it, this guy in the middle would go, Young Thug Daily. He would just like yell that in the middle of the song. So I was like singing it and I was like, Young Thug say like nothing well, there's nothing at that part of the song and i was like that was someone else who put that in the song and i still hear those those people's names that they yell out in the versions that i downloaded to this day for certain songs and i just remember that being like a more fun thing i don't know no the, the file sharing thing is is a big one like the one I was going through it and thinking about like the most impactful for me. I think Kaza was probably the sweet spot. If anybody remembers Kaza, like with, I think with two A's, but it it was bizarre how nostalgic you can get for software. Like going and just looking at like Google images or like old Kaza interfaces, just be like, oh my God, that was my childhood is waiting for stuff to download in this. Just songs or stupid clips. I mean, a lot of Dragon Ball uh, AMVs, stuff like that. That was kind of peak of that era. But in terms of like the most impactful file sharing thing for me. And Sarah, I'm curious if this was in your arena as well, but um, because you're kind of the software queen of USA and stuff, but uh, going to the University of Minnesota, coming from like rural Minnesota, internet (gasps) sucked, file sharing sucked. Are you talking about what I think you're talking about? The hub? The hub? Did you have the (gasps) hub too? 
Oh my god, yes. That's hubba, how I watched hubba. Game of Thrones. Oh, weird timing. Yeah, yeah, okay, of course. So the hub, it was truly ridiculous because if you're in the dorms at the University of Minnesota, they were all interconnected via the software and it was called the hub. And so everyone would just upload everything they had. And so if you were in the dorms, it was just like this hive mind where you could literally download like seasons of a TV show within seconds. It mm -hmm. was the fastest thing. I could not comprehend how fast it was going compared to just slowly crawling along with every other file sharing service. So like everybody's taste in movies, TV, music, everything just blasted. And it was like the greatest hive mind of media content. And then you could like bond based on that. Like, God, I love this person's music taste. Let's go, look at all this. I'm just going to grab all that, bring it to my stockpile and like, all of my music that I still have now in Google Music is still all derived from just like the army of files that I built up thanks to the hub at the U. I totally forgot about that. But yeah, when like I was using it, I think it was kind of on the way out because that stuff was getting a lot more easier to like access legally. Sure. Um, and like primarily, yeah, I had like the first two seasons of Game of Thrones via that, but somebody had to show me it because I don't think it was actively being shared as much anymore. Yeah. But it still existed. And I think people were still like keeping things up and stuff. I was trying to look at it online just to see like, is there any other record of people freaking out about this? And there's a couple of Reddit threads about people being bummed out because apparently the people who ran the hub, they eventually graduated or college or something dumb and they just kind of let it all die. But it is like, that was just peak college, mind blown thing. Other people had their minds blown by different things in college. But for me, it was just how fast I could download episodes of the British office and be like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I've got one. Yeah. Uh, thought that it's weird that uh, everyone has like a a whole desktop screen and like the only thing that goes on it is a picture and icons. Um, and and like a while ago when I was into the like PC building community of Reddit, I would see people with these like very fancy aesthetic uh, desktops and I'd be like, what's that? Uh, what that is, is a program called Rain Meter, which is um, something that's like very old at this point. And I don't know if it's been updated in years, but like for me, I've had I used to ha have it like a way more complex thing where my desktop would show it would show the time. It would show the date in, in like fancy font, not just, you know, at the bottom. It would show the weather, but it wouldn't just say the weather. It would just say, like, you need a jacket or you don't need a jacket. <laughs> it would have, you know, your CPU temperature and it would have like a little uh, animated equalizer for whatever music you were listening to. And I like I don't use that as much anymore, but I do just have. But still to this day on my two desktops, like big clocks very visible i don't put windows over them and it's just like a you know a nice aesthetic thing running on this years old program called rain meter and like i don't know what the alternatives for this are if there are any it's kind of like widgets on your phone but it doesn't seem like using those on a desktop computer is nearly as common and it's just like it's something on my desktop every single day that i look at and use and sometimes i think about the fact that it's this program called rain meter that just starts up when i start up my computer oh that's funny that's a weird one. i hadn't heard of that but chat is lighting up apparently there's a lot of love for rain meter out there sarah all right wow yeah. us I don't know if this is like, this isn't my favorite software, but when it comes to the software that impacted my life the most, it's got to be Microsoft Excel. I, mm. you will, you would be surprised how much Microsoft Excel and your favorite JRPG go hand in hand. Your precious JRPGs, every single letter, every single text in those, Excel documents. Just every single word in an entire game in one huge Excel document and that's how we would like edit it. Like there's a line for Japanese, a line for translating, a line for just like editing it. And then a bunch of like translator notes, like just like, like hundreds of those documents to make your favorite little precious JRPG, even in like now. And you know how much they would crash and you would just lose like five hours of work on your uh... game. Just awful, awful. But it's like Excel's not made for localizing video games. It's not. How is but that stole what they primarily use to localize video games. Like Nintendo has their own proprietary software. Okay. That's basically just like Excel, but with more locks on it. So you can't like leak the game, but like Nintendo of Europe does it anyway. So like 
you know, don't blame me. But um, <laughs> yeah, Excel, man. I don't, I don't want to see it. I don't want to look at it. But it's everywhere. It's all in your favorite video games. I am so naive when it comes to Excel. Like I barely use it. So I see like the default once layout. You learn a bit. That's it's really fun. Like fun? pivot tables in Excel. Like once you get a handle on how to set up a pivot table and then doing stuff with data, it can be crazy how quick. Like when I was in journalism school, one of the skills they taught us was Excel. And then you, we would download data from public databases, create pivot tables. And then you could just be like, what'd be a fun story? Like how much did the government spend on pool maintenance this year? And then you just pull down two things and it's like, boom, and you just have the number. You can control V, control C, put in your story. It's like, what about how much they spent on grass maintenance? And you could just be like, boom, 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 and just have all those numbers in two seconds. It's really, it, it, it becomes fun. Oh, God. You want to hear the most damning thing? Like all of MinMax's expenses and all the numbers, everything. I just have it in a Google Doc. I just have it like written out there. Every, every once in a while, my not wife even, will see it. Not even it. Google Sheets? No, no. Google Sheets. Are you a it's monster? In, it's intimidating. You I share don't know. with the IRS is like can't edit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gross. I, it's, anyone, it feels... anyone with this link has access kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, it's too mathematical yeah. otherwise. It just feels nasty. Not even Google Sheets? No. It's no. like I, I felt bad because up until this year, I had everything in Google Sheets. But now I feel like I was a freaking pro compared to <laughs> <laughs> So do you just write down like March? Three thousand dollars. Yeah, and then what you, else? Like, add is... it on a calculator, and you put like some. Right. Yeah. How do you? How do you like add? You know, like the Google Sheets can add it for you, right? Um. Honestly, um. That's where my wife comes in, and then she brings into Excel and does some magic with it every once in a while. If I don't oh, want okay. to do it all manually. Oh. So, well, okay. So, so, so somebody knows what they're doing. Wife. <laughs> oh yeah, I should have mentioned that a long time ago. But okay, do you think like like for localization, Sarah, are they using Google Sheets just so, like it can't crash or no. it would save now? Like it needs to be offline, so it needs to be Excel. We I've used. Google Sheets for like non giant AAA projects, so more like indie projects because it's easier and everybody can access it. But for like the big, big projects that we're like keeping security tight really, really matters. Yeah. You just take the Excel sheet and someone will download it and then upload it back to like a server and then someone else will download it, upload it back to a server and then you just go back and forth that way. <sighs> and you have to make sure you don't like overwrite somebody who already has the document checked no, out. Yeah, oh like, God. Excel isn't like made for text. It's supposed to be for numbers, but the entire like Japanese video game ecosphere like re revolves around all translation via Excel because it's not just English. It's like English, German, French, Spanish, all of the languages. Excel document. That's ridiculous. So, so I mean, for reference for people who might not uh, be hip to the scene, like you worked on Xenoblade Chronicles X. That's always my go-to when I think of uh, your work at 8.4. Yeah. Like, you the were biggest ones that I've worked on in Excel, Monster Hunter Worlds. Fire Emblem Echoes, Near Automata, also Excel documents. Whoa! Um, <laughs> they're like they're massive. They're huge. I want to see those. Like what? Some indie RPG. I want them to share their Excel spreadsheet of all like these your Excel documents. <laughs> yeah, I want to see that. I want to dive into the weeds on that. It'll be fun. I, I was doing like research maybe. for a story once on uh, her interactive with the Nancy Drew games, and I pitched it to some place who wanted it, and then I did the research, and they're like, "Never mind," which sucked. But I did learn a, that they use Excel documents for their. Nancy Drew games too. So like, what happens if you fail the puzzle? She says this, blah, blah, blah. And they like just do trees that mm -hmm. go for the whole entire game. Um, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out how freaked out I should be about like AI stuff, um, you know, I'm like replacing jobs. I do think about like the, what Excel does used to be an office floor of people. Like, it, right. you know, it's like right. if you think about like how how did bookkeeping work before you could like write all your numbers in a document that you could look at anywhere and could be infinitely large and stored on, you know, nothing. It's like it was a floor of an office building that did that. And now it's Microsoft Excel. And I don't know if that's like good or bad, but it uh, it, it kind of freaks me out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Haley, you got another one? Uh, yeah. Does this one count MSN? Like the old MSN mm -hmm. Absolutely. that was really downloaded. Absolutely. God, like uh, the show Pen15, if y'all have seen that show, they have a great sequence of them using MSN that hits the nail on the head to how it felt. It was like you run home and you just hop on it and all your friends are online and like the, the person you like comes online. Like, oh my God, you change your status to something cool. So maybe they'll <laughs> notice you. And I saw a TikTok recently. Did it have recently. like away messages too? Like yeah. if you're mad at somebody, you'd leave a really cryptic away message. Yes. So everyone knows you're mad, but they don't know at who. 
It'd be like, I'd be like away, like going to bounce on best trampoline. Like anyone cared. <laughs> I was just like, no one cared. I was just like, everyone's going to know I'm having fun today. And like, oh my God, it was so fun. I saw a TikTok recently that was all the little like gifts that came with MSN and it made my brain melt. I was like, oh my God, I, like just seeing those again took me right back to how it felt to use that. It was such a kind of same energy as the hub. Like everyone rushes home to talk to each other yeah. on that. And that's the only way you can talk to your friends after school because none of us had phones. So it's just mm-hmm. like doing that was so fun. Trying to get the coolest name. Yep. Like I, I used uh, my name was coconut one, two, three underscore one, two, three for s- tons of stuff for years. My dog's name was Coconut. And I was like, this is, oh my God, I got it. It's like the longest name with an underscore. In it. You're still psyched. That's, how, that's how hard it was to get names. It was such an era. You know, it is funny, like how emotional the messengers can be. Because one of my favorite pieces of software ever was ICQ was like my equivalent. I don't know if that like predates MSN or just like a different group, but that was it. Do you guys know ICQ, like a little flower? No. And when someone would send you a message, you go, oh, It's like classic sound effects, (laughs) iconic sound effects coming through. But I remember like, you know, it was probably peak like fifth grade. And so like start just all of the social dynamics of school coming rushing into this program Mm -hmm. and like, okay, uh, the cute girl, Jess, she's online. So I got to send her a message to say hi. Okay. She didn't respond to me, but if I send her two hellos, then maybe she will. Like just like Mm -hmm. that weird level of interaction. And I remember my brain was broken where I remember one day walking into middle school and walking in with uh, Danielle, um, and I was just like, hey, how's it going? She's like, oh, good, how are you? Good. And I remember saying like, oh, this is just like one of our ICQ conversations. Like, I feel like ICQ taught me how to talk and just the basics of like, hey, how's it going there? Oh, pretty good. Like, as a kid, you don't really have those conversations, but somehow it became formalized yeah, yeah. through the software. So, mine was like, my main one was AIM. Yeah. Um, mm. I got so fast at typing. That's where I got all my typing stuff yes, from. Yes, yes. Because it's like you were talking back and forth and you had to go like as fast as possible basically to like get everything out. Um, but yeah, I got into so much trouble using that because you'd be like, you'd have like two people up, like the uh, your best friend and then like the guy she has a crush on. And I'd be like, do you like Amy? And then I'd be like, Amy, do you like, and they'll be like, hey, so-and-so, Amy said she likes you. I was a pot stirrer, okay? <laughs> they need to take that app away from me, okay? Because I, that's just, they should I was like third grade, they should have gotten me off that. Oof, so more harm than good? <laughs> yeah, more harm than good. <laughs> uh, mine was, I, I won't do a separate one, but it was, it was AIM for me, and yeah, uh, yeah it, the same, I mean, it was like, it was great, because it was like, yeah, I was not afraid to talk to people as much as I would yeah. have been, but I mean, like, that's it. I, it, it does seem like social dynamics got worse, uh, when, <laughs> like, in real life, when that was there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's weird because it's it's much easier for me to think of old software that I like, you know, I know new, same here. new software is just like work and I, whatever, you know, it's now. like I don't I don't have warm feelings about like Adobe Premiere. Um, <laughs> no, <one> but <laughs> I do really like um, there is a, a modern piece of software that I use sometimes called Google Earth Studio, which is um, a a like Google produced thing. It's an official thing. You have to apply to access to it or for it, I think. But I I think they just grant it to anyone who applies. But what it is, is it's the classic kind of Google Earth. You've got the globe. You can rotate it around, which Google Earth could be one of these. Because the first time. Oh, Google my God. Earth that's a good the, point. You know, most mind blowing yeah. thing on Earth. Oh. Um, but uh, what this does is it basically lets you keyframe camera movements into Google Earth like pretty precisely, you know, kind of like angle, elevation, you know, place. And then it will like go between them and it will render out like the highest possible photo for each position. And so like I have used in my videos several times these kind of like keyframed Google Earth videos where it's like, okay, I want to show how far it is from north carolina to the grand canyon and then you can like zoom out you know all the way up to the united states and then zoom back in on the grand canyon and like with with the same tools that basically you would use to like scale a video in premiere or something and it's really cool like it's it's pretty easy to use if you have some idea of how keyframing works and like it's really high quality honestly i 
I only stopped using it when Microsoft Flight Simulator came out because Flight Simulator is somehow like a better looking version of Google Earth. <laughs> but like, uh, it's if if you just want to kind of like if you're making a video and you want to have some sense of geography in it, it looks a lot better than. I like the aesthetic more than stock footage, personally, because mm-hmm. I just I don't like stock footage. And this you can get really specific with what you're showing. That's sweet. Google Earth Studios know that. Yeah, their animation oh. reel is, is already perfect. Yeah. Sarah, top Earth. Oof. Topping Earth. Um, I would say that if you like pixel art, a sprite is the best software for you to use. That's what I used to make my uh, Twitch background and all my little like Twitch Windows recolorings is you using made A-Sprite. all those? Yeah, well, I recolored. You know, a lot of it was like just recoloring with like cool. my colors in A Sprite. So yeah, A Sprite. Um, they use it in a lot of pixel games. Uh, it's a really cool pixel art software that if you ever want to just dabble in pixel art, I think that's like the best place to start. Yeah, and it's spelled... you can do animations too, so it's very cool. That's it cool. Does look awesome, and it's A S E Sprite uh, for this mm-hmm. thing. That's sweet. Good pick, good pick, great pick, Sarah. Uh, Haley, last one. What do you got? Um, this is a recent one, but the software that came with my Elgato mic, the Wave Three software, I love that software. It's so good. It essentially just splits all my audio into different channels I can assign stuff to, and then it has two um, meters for each, one for what I hear and one for what I want to output, say to like Streamlabs or something. So if the game, if I I put all the game audio in one channel, it's just called game. And if I wanted a certain level, but everyone in the chat is complaining it's too loud, I can just turn it down for them and not me. So I can keep hearing it how I want to hear it and they can have it lower. And like, I know a lot of other stuff does that, but this really just harmonizes everything into one little appeasing, like nice to look at box with all little levels and they bounce up and down so you can know exactly what's going on. Your mic goes into it. You can apply effects to your mic in the software. So if you want a noise gate or like they have their proprietary ones, but you can also upload whatever ones you want. So you can just really set up your audio. So there's no panic during live streams about like, Oh, how do I turn it down for just, you can just go whoop right. and then go back and you can also sync it up with like your, um, your stream deck and stuff um, so that you could just press a button in your stream deck if you want to lower audio on a certain level to that. I, I haven't gotten that far. I set that all up and then I found out I just wasn't using it. I'd rather just move my mouse two inches and yeah. do it manually. But as someone who was really intimidated by the audio aspect of streaming, it's made it super simple. That's right. What's the name of that one again? Um, I would think it's just be called, I have it over here. It's just the Wavelink software. Wavelink software for Elgato. Mm-hmm. For Elgato. Sorry. Um, yeah, Jacob, uh, I know you said you can't be nostalgic or really too in love with Adobe Premiere, but uh, my number one would be Final Cut Pro 7, specifically. <laughs> like, Final Cut Pro, uh, Apple's video editing software, it was it came around in the right time of my life where I took, like, a video production class in high school, and, like, I loved shooting stupid videos before that, but then I just, I was so amazed by, like, how complex... And in depth, you could get and how complicated the software was, but it's like you could understand the basics pretty quickly. And it just felt like, okay, I've never felt more at home in software than Final Cut Pro. And the fact that for whatever reason, like our high school had Final Cut compared to just iMovie or some trash like that, I'm still so thankful because that was also, you know, like 2005, 2004, when big movies started to be edited in Final Cut Pro. So I'd hear about like, oh, North Country was edited in Final Cut. And I was like, yeah, that's the software I use. I can do this. This is so sweet. Um, and so I was with Final Cut for so long. And then Final Cut Pro 7, which I think was like 2009 when that came out, um, that's when it came in like this big editing suite. But it's like, well, I'm pot committed. I love Final Cut so much. So now I need to buy this package that came with like Apple Motion and Compressor and all this stuff. And it was $1,000 for that wow. software. But it's like, well... If I want to be a video editor, I just need to bite this bullet. And so maybe it's just uh, being pot committed there financially then uh, where I couldn't look away. But I love Final Cut so much. And then eventually at Game Informer, it got to the point of like, eh, they're not updating Final Cut Pro 7. There's One of the quirks is it doesn't ingest file types too well. So you have to do a lot of converting before you bring stuff into Final Cut. So I was dragged kicking and screaming to Adobe Premiere. But then I immediately remapped my default Adobe Premiere layout to look like the interface for Final Cut. Like I still am clinging to the memories of Final Cut Pro 7, uh, but it's 
getting more and more faint every day. But I always thought... Like if, you're not over an ex and you're I'm dressing not. up your current yeah. partner to look like your ex. <laughs> <laughs> that ex cost me $1,000, Haley. What am I supposed to do? Just ignore it? Uh, but I always thought, like, if I ever got a tattoo, if I was forced to get a tattoo, I'd love to get the little razor blade from Final Cut Pro, like that little icon for editing. But it'd be too uh, cool and yeah, straight edge and emo. Yeah, a tattoo of a razor blade might have other connotations. But this would be like a pixelated razor blade. So everyone would be okay. like, oh, Final Cut, right on. But you're like healthy yeah, emotionally. Yeah, see that. And they go, oh, Final Cut. It's pixelated, don't worry. Don't worry. software. <laughs> Sweet. I don't like Premiere either, bro. <laughs> Jacob, last one. What do you got? Uh, yeah, okay. So first... Before I do my last one, I want to cheat a little and talk about something that's kind of a game, but it was an educational software. Uh, ben, can you play the audio clip that I just dropped in the Cohorts Text Updates channel? I just want to see how many people in the audience this will uh, activate. Oh, Because good. I think I think it will be uh, a, a significant number. Here we go. <laughs> It's a red-tailed hawk flying over a Corvette. This is the sweetest thing I've ever seen. I feel like oh, Biden's awakened tattoo. like a sleeper cell agent. Like, I'm, I'm awake. <laughs> All right, now command them, Jacob. Command them. Eyewitness. Uh, my favorite educational program. Most of them were, like, well, they had those big books that were, like, you know, just kind of white, very simple design, yeah. and they just have pictures of like, here's the one on, you know, medieval knights, and here's the one on birds, and you just look at a bunch of those. Then they had videos, uh, but the most important to me was uh, was their various kind of games, and specifically one called Eyewitness Dinosaur Hunter, where you got to like walk around this kind of creepy dinosaur museum, and you would just like do exhibits that would be like, hey, this dinosaur is faster than this other one. But it was like the the tone was very ominous. Like they were definitely playing with some Jurassic Park esque vibes. And I have I have tried to get Dinosaur Hunter running on my current computer and it involves like uh, pretending that you're in another operating system mm -hmm. at a level oh, that I, I just don't know how to do. Like you I've, have to I've run the old operating times. system in a window and then put the game in. The, that's how you yes. what you need for like the old like Nancy Drew games and the old Barbie games. Oh yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> Sarah, maybe I can ask for your help at some point. <laughs> um, uh, but it is a game, and so I I'll say my last uh, my last piece of software is Kid Picks. Um, Ooh, okay. Kid Picks is is just the kind of like Microsoft paint esque program that like I learned it's one of the first pieces of software that I remember like learning how to use in school and it's just kind of like you know you've got oh your spray paint and you've got your bucket and your fill but it was kind of goofy it had lots of things that would kind of do the work for you where it was like here's a fun pattern that you can uh, stamp on it the undo button was just this bald man who would say things when you clicked on him, what? including like, I made a boo boo. Yeah. <laughs> like when, <laughs> when you, when you click on do, and that's very locked in my memory, but it's really, it was just like, like when I started using a computer in like first grade, when we went to the computer lab, they were like, here you mm -hmm. go. Kid picks, see what you can do with this. Oh, and then I remember great. once the teacher told us to draw Noah's Ark, which was very strange because I went to a public non-religious school, but everybody knows it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's true. She just said draw a boat. Yeah, but are you kidding? Because then you get the detail of all the animals in there. That's that's a great prompt. I'll defend that. <laughs> Separation of church and state, my butt, because drawing Noah's Ark is sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, it is. I mean, Sarah, you're talking about like, you know, typing so fast and learning the types of as because of the messaging stuff. Like I was thinking about just computer lab and I also, mm -hmm. you, I assume everybody here had oh, the feeling of like, Oh, we're, we're breaking computer the system lab this afternoon. Hell yeah. yeah. But it was just so we're gonna play easy. Minecraft in the browser. Oh my God. You can do that. Um, yeah. but it was just so easy. Cause like, yeah, I was playing online games at that point. And so I also was like learning to type as fast as possible and ICQ teaching to type as fast as possible. So every time we had like a typing speed test, I was like, Baby games. This is the easiest thing in the world. Everyone else is hunting and pecking. It's like, please get on ICQ I, losers. I, I, I really try to not be like a generations younger than me are losing it. But like 
you do i i do think that like being able to use like a finder in a computer is like a really important thing just being able to use like a file explorer system or whatever which was like kind of computer lab stuff and sure. like you certainly hear stories on like the teachers subreddit where they talk about how gen alpha is going to hell uh but like about how kids just like don't know how to kind of use they don't know how to use like the nitty gritty stuff of a computer because they've been kind of they've grown up on like apps which don't require you to like mess with software right um and and so yeah it's like i'm i am glad that i had and you know and learning to type which was uh important but like i'm glad that i was kind of presented with like a desktop computer and they were like here's how you open something here's how you mm -hmm. hit like file new you know canvas yeah no for sure all right sarah last one last one this is a it's is a deep cut for the the Mac users in the 2010s. Oh. If you wanted to Listen. play League of Legends on your Mac, you couldn't. You had to go through a software called Wine, which was basically like an emulator that wasn't boot camp. Because you know how you'd have to boot camp Max to play right, any kind right. of like Steam game? Wine was like a specific emulator that would run League of Legends on your MacBook. Whoa, huh? okay. So shout out to Wine, but also... If I could go back in time and delete a software, it would be Wine, so that I never played League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> if we, so if we ever put Sarah Plays League of Legends up for New Show Plus, it'd be a traumatic experience for you? It would. Oh, my okay. God. Okay, sorry. What? Would that just make your MacBook sound like a jet engine taking off? Oh, absolutely. Off? Oh, it would, like, it would like, heat up game. my desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Let us know in the comments, favorite piece of software, give us your top three, top one, all that fun stuff. We like to hear it. Um... You know what my favorite software is? From software. Ladies and gentlemen, Elden Ring's Whoa. back, baby. How did I not see that? <laughs> We're Good one. gearing up. Please, down in front. Everyone relax. Uh, Jacob and Sarah, you're going back to Elden Ring. Um, it, what What is this? Just you can't handle the hype what is for, for Erd Tree? What are you what doing? Why are you going back to that good game? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? You don't want to start playing your two-year-old character at the beginning of the DLC. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And Sarah, what's your journey been like here going back to this thing? It's it's so weird because I it kind of feels like I'm like going through a drive through at McDonald's because I know like I kind of know what I want at this point in Elden Ring. Like I have a right. build. So it's like, mm, can I get a uh, one Reduvia with the side of a <laughs> somber smithing stone? And then a uh, can I get a, a bloodhound thing? Like I it's so weird going at it again. Because, like, in the beginning, you're just kind of grabbing whatever, and you're like, is this weapon good? No. Is this weapon good? No. Right. But now I'm like, okay, I got it. I know exactly what I want. I'm going to be knocking on Mog's door, like, right when the DLC comes out. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be ready. And plus, like, I imagine your Twitch chat. Are you streaming it? Yeah. Okay. I imagine your Twitch chat also has just had so much time to dissect everything going on in Elden Ring that they just have opinions even more so. I'm like, okay, no, actually, if you do this over here and you get this over here, you'll be even stronger. It's like everyone is just I know that like, you have like a traumatizing Twitch chat. It's it's a bit much. But yeah. I put my Twitch chat in their place, okay? And also they have no expectations <laughs> for me. Um, I know like you're worried that people are going to come in and tell you what to do. We have a very understanding relationship with Elden Ring. Um, it's not about being good. It's about being right. good enough yeah. to get get through Elden Ring. So you're telling um, me your Twitch so, chat is it, it isn't filled with people being like, actually, if you do this instead, if you do this instead. No, because you know what we tell those people? We tell them to shut up. <laughs> Interesting Ben, you tell those people to shut up. This is not their stream. This is your stream. God damn. I like how right now in, in the chat, the backstage chat, I'm just like, she knows her Twitch chat heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> someone else says Sarah yelled at me in chat. <laughs> so what's the, what's the build you're going for? Where are you at in the game? Give us all those good deeds. I'm doing another bleed build. I'm like just starting out. Um, unfortunately, I'm still not good enough to do some of the better builds, but I feel like bleed is just like my favorite. Yeah. You, you were tempted to completely shake it up, go for like the dragon build or something more I, wacky. In my new game plus, I did like a magic build where you mm. got like, I forgot what it was, but you got that laser and you would just chug yeah, a the, mana potion the, like, and you would just, uh, the moon beam or whatever it is. Ha. Yeah, the Kamehameha and like that was fun. Um, but I'm definitely more of a ankle biter as a player. <laughs> I like to get up there on their ankles, slash right. them up. That's yeah. my favorite kind of play style. Do you feel like better than you remembered it being going back to it? Yeah, I don't know. Like it, it. I, you know, you you open up on the game and you're like, wow, I forgot how great this was. Like after we had Elden Ring and then we had like Baldur's Gate three, and I feel like this year I play Elden Ring and like nothing still has topped Elden Ring for me this year. Okay. 
I will say. So it's like it's it's nice to go back. Nice to go back to a good game. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Hell yeah. It's I will. I mean, it's like it's weird because I feel like Elden Ring doesn't have one thing that is like so, so much better than every other game that like that's what you remember it for. And so it had kind of slipped in my memory just because I was like, I guess I like Elden Ring. You know, I like all those Dark Souls games. And then like going back, there is just there's just kind of an electricity to it that is hard to describe but you just like you really get in and it's like being able i don't know the the feeling of like overcoming stuff in that game and kind of getting to choose what you're going to tackle what you're going to come back to and i will also say in this playthrough which like i had previously previously spent 120 hours uh, playing Elden Ring i got to an a full area that i had never been to before just like like a, not not just like a cave, but like a section that had its own map that I had to find that I had not played. I was like, I'm playing the DLC already. This is new <laughs> content of the Hold the Ring to me after two years of thinking I knew this game. Where is it? It's it is it's like the dark root or like it, it, it's something. It's basically I never did the thing where you fought the two big gargoyles and then went up the waterfall in the coffin, oh. which is like a major storyline thing. That was a hard but battle. That was a hard fight. I just I, I just never even found it because it's kind of you kind of have to like jump off a cliff while you're already in the underground part. And then there's this whole new thing. Um, and and yeah, it's just this like entire new area, including I posted on my Instagram story like some imagery that is so messed up that it's just like there's just a big horrible face here and i've never seen this before and this has been like lurking in the game the whole time <laughs> jesus I'm surprised you never saw like a post somewhere and it was just like what's that face you know like you even missed it on social media too. i probably did but i didn't realize you know it's like okay maybe i didn't turn this corner and see it is what i was assuming mm. and not right. like there is a new freaking you know mm -hmm. sector that i could wander into Jesus. is this the fia area like where you fight all the people that like fia's hugged yes <laughs> i love that area that's that is exactly i love her it it's so much fun going into it after having watched like a bunch of vati videos too where he someone's like explain the lore to me like over and over and over again and i show up and i'm just like in one ear out the other i'm like of I'm like, you, you look familiar to me. You Fia, look familiar to me. Tragic. I think you're important, <laughs> but I don't remember you. Right, right. What do, what's uh, the build then, Jacob? What are you going for? I I wanted to do something with faith, which I don't, I never really start with, but I kind of, I'm still leveling faith, but I grabbed the blasphemous blade from Rikard, which is this blade that's just covered in like little arms. It's the little tiny Barbie arms. Yes. And it has <laughs> it has it's like Ash of War, its special ability is just this like giant, you know, spout of lava that kind of erupts out of the ground. And it's so powerful that it's like that's my I just hit L2 and like and that just takes out enemies and bosses and everything else. Oh, that's so sweet. Elden Ring, it's coming back, ben, everybody. When are you, ben, when are you jumping back in? When are you getting back on this horse, Ben? I don't know if I want to. I'm kind of scared. Ben, I'm gonna... scared, sir. I'm scared to go back to it. I feel like... You know, I was scared. It's not a scary. It's not scary. Yeah. I just feel like I ran a marathon once, and I'm glad I did it. But then the devil was like, hey, why don't you go run a marathon? And it's like, ah, you know what? Uh, walking's okay, too. You don't have to too. go as far. Yeah. I would recommend starting a new game, though. So you don't want a new game plus yeah. it. And it's, yeah. it's like, I have played in this prep for the DLC, I have played 30 hours now. And it's like, I'm going five times faster through yeah. these areas mm -hmm. than I did when I originally that played it. I'm still at 30 hours. Right. Yeah, I I should, I would like to try a completely different build. I think that would be interesting. I think it would open my eyes a lot to the game because I was really a, a simpleton. I was like, all right. I got my halberd. I'm just going to use that through the entire game and I'll stick with my simple moves. And based on Jacob wincing, um, I guess I played the game wrong. So there might be something there. No, you didn't play it wrong. You played it fine, uh -huh. but you can play it more fun. Okay. All right. That's certainly an option. Uh, DLC, that's June, right? End of June? I think June 21st for the Elden Ring stuff. It's going to consume yeah. everything you on the internet. You got to get started, bud. You got to... Yeah. Nope. Gotta get your plan ready. Oh, God. Yeah, you're totally right. Um, hey, did you guys watch any of that uh, Nintendo uh, Indie World showcase? I watched. 
Okay. The Min-Max live stream of it. <gasps> that was us. Yeah, we had uh, Huber and Kelsey and Leo and I doing a reaction to that if you want to check it out on YouTube. Uh, what stood out the most for you there, Haley? Um, oh, the um, something laser eyes. I wrote it down. Lorelai and the laser eyes. That looks so cool. Yeah. By from... the devs who made Sayonara Wild Hearts, which I love that game. That game's so good. Yeah, and Year Walk just... and Device 6. It looks so funky. It's like It yeah. looks like black and white Resident Evil, but upping the number of puzzles to a ridiculous degree. And like the witness energy too with like the, with the way some of the puzzles looked where it was environment move, mixing with normal style like custom like puzzles. Like just a maze but then it looks like when you step away the maze is implemented into other areas of the map too. All there was right. one guy whose face was a maze and he looked like he was fighting you. It's like do you go through his face maze to beat him? <laughs> That's kind of cool. Like it, there's a it piqued my interest a lot. The trailer was also really well edited. Oh, it's it great. cut to so many different cool things. I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa." And by the end of it I was like, "Yep, that's that's for me. That's a Halo game." Yep, editing wise, it was definitely the, the best trailer there, but it's Laura Line Laser yeah. Eyes coming out May 16th and Apernas published on that thing. Yeah, that that looked fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um they kicked off the show with a new way forward game, which is always exciting to see those folks just crank out what seems like 17 games a year. Um, but this is a new Yars game for fans of Yars Revenge, the old Atari game. And Sarah, I need you to not scream in excitement when I'm talking about Yars Revenge, please. Uh, but this is called Yars Rising and Atari is publishing this new thing. We're like old Yars Revenge. It was like, uh, I guess sci-fi shooting bugs, whatever the hell. Uh, but now it's a platformer from way forward. That's very sci-fi themed. And like the opening shot is the main character, like shooting a Kamehameha blast, but it looks cool. It's fun to see Atari keep reimagining its old IP and making people like Leo and Huber go like, what, what the hell is Yars? Who is Howard Scott Warshaw? <laughs> what is all this? <laughs> I was like, you all were like, three of you were so excited. I was like, what is this? Yars. We're Yars fanatics. I think mainly we're just fans of uh, Atari 50. And I think, I'm pretty sure Yars Revenge was in Atari 50 for that package mm -hmm. and stuff. But, um, but uh, a game that looked fantastic and dropped a demo uh, as well is called Europa. Uh, I don't know if you guys, Sarah and Jacob have seen this, but it's, it's directly in your wheelhouses. I feel like it's, it's a very cozy exploration 3d platformer. Um, but there's a demo out today for Europa. So I booted it up just to check it out. And, uh, it is quite cool. It's one of those demos that you start and within five minutes. It's like, yep, yep. I am looking forward to this game in, in a big way, um, where it is, uh, I believe a solo developer and he was an environment artist at blizzard making like maps for overwatch. And so just I love when people spin off a triple A and do their own little thing. That is like a favorite thing. Yeah, especially like, you know, say what you will about Overwatch 2, but like still all those maps are so the maps are gorgeous. amazing. And so They're, taking every that, single one's amazing. Yep, but putting that into a giant a 3D platformer environment where you're like floating and gliding around, you're sliding down hills. It kind of has a journey vibe to it. Um, you know, it it's the type of game that opens with an Alan Watts quote. So you know the mood that they want to have you in going into this thing, but it's called Europa. And I think the idea is like you're from Earth and you're going to Europa. Uh, the moon, but it's been like terraformed in this weird way. So you're exploring this beautiful version of it, but it looks awesome. Um, and then Steamworld Heist 2 was probably the other uh, big thing they closed out with that uh, they're making a new Steamworld Heist Huber's game. Huber's excitement for that was pretty palpable. I oh, noticed. he was super into it for sure. But a really, a really good showcase, a, a good variety of stuff there. If you want to check out the reaction on MinMax's YouTube channel. Um, Sarah, you said after our Monday meeting, you chimed in, we we're talking about the podcast. And you're like, yeah, I mean, I guess I've been playing Sims 1 if we want to talk about it. Um, and there's nothing I'd rather do in the world than talk about The Sims 1. What is going I was so surprised by your reaction. Dude. So I was like, yeah, I'm like, you know, replaying Elden Ring and like also like the original Sims. Oh my God. The Sims 1 was such an important game for me. Uh, I mean, I had never considered that a game like that was possible. And for like, I guess we were all 13 at the time when it came out. And so like what all my- We were all. We were I was every, in third grade. Everybody <laughs> at the, on earth was 13. No, like all my we friends. We were all 13, all of us together. No, but like all I my friends seven. playing it and then like just going to each other's houses and like comparing mm -hmm. and just like, oh, it's yes. such a weird game to watch your friends play. Did you like, also light your friends on fire? Like people you didn't like? Mm, yeah. How'd I mean, you play? How'd you play? Because like I would go over to my friend's house who would like be in her family PC- closet yeah. which is what it was and we would just be like picking people that we didn't like and we were just like 
find different ways to kill them like the oven the rocket like taking away the ladders in the pool we were like what can we do yeah a lot of that a lot of like okay we're gonna make your little brother in this game but then we're gonna torture him and he's gonna pee his pants and we're all gonna laugh at him and point at him and a lot of cyber bullying through the sims i feel like it's a really (laughs) ripe vessel for that but why are you going back to the sims one and is it one of those things where you have to boot up some wine program to get it running or what the hell's going on here I honestly don't remember how I got it, but I have the entirety of The Sims 1. um, And I was playing The Sims 4, and I was just getting so frustrated at how poorly it was running. Like, it just doesn't run great. It's like, it's a bunch of, like, legacy code on top of legacy code, and it's just all broken. Um, And it's so refreshing to go back to the original Sims and have The Sims actually do what you tell them to do. (laughs) Which which was insane to me. Like, it somehow runs better, which makes (laughs) sense because it's not as complicated, but, like, it runs better. And The Sims, it's harder. It's such a different game. Because The Sims 4, like, the way The Sims has, like, developed is now The Sims 4 is, like, all about control, right? Mm. Everything is within your control. You can, like, these Sims don't even, like, without me telling them to do it, you know? Like, I have an iron fist. (laughs) And then it's, like, but now it's, like, The Sims, they have, like, anxiety. And, like, my Sims get anxious and depressed. No. And it's, like, I don't have time for, like, your anxiety and depression. Like, what about me? Um... (laughs) So I gave it up and I went back to the original Sims to check it out and I forgot how it's it's a lot harder than the actual Sims. Ooh, okay. Than the, the Sims 4. Because it's like, I'm just trying to chill. I'm trying to make money. There's no weekends. Every day is the same. Right. Nobody ages. There's no weekend. Yeah, no time off. You're constantly just going to work every day. And it's like, I'm just trying to make money. And then all of a sudden, someone walks in my back door and like steals my oven. <laughs> and I'm like, oh well, God, how do I feed my family music? now? The yeah, and the, the burglar music, music? is scary thing of all time strikes fear in my soul that's funny. when you hear like the, the something bad's about to happen like, and then <laughs> my kid like wouldn't go to school like no. she just wouldn't get on the bus and then she got shipped off to military school so i would never see her again <laughs> and the parents did not give a f- <laughs> the parents like n- like in the original in sims 4 they would be crying screaming throwing up like on the floor <laughs> these sims they, they were like who i'm sorry who was that <laughs> we don't know her. We had a kid. I don't remember having a kid. Um, but yeah, it's so hard to play when you're not just like cheating yourself money. So then I started cheating myself money and it got yeah. a lot more fun. Okay. All <laughs> right. It has exactly the same energy as Leo describing what he did in Shadow of War last week. It just, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, going back that sequence of events is like and then they was scared of spiders and then he wouldn't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> what is um what is the cheat code for money again in Sims 1? This, the one thousand one is Rosebud. Rosebud. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. When I tried Motherlode, Mother didn't Lode have work? it. Oh yeah. I couldn't oh, get Motherlode to work. I was like, am I spelling it wrong? I don't know. I think it might have just. Was it just Rose? I remember I typing think it was Rosebud, Rosebud over, but then and, over, over, over and over and over and over because only a thousand simoleons. That's yeah. not nearly enough. God, that soundtrack, like the mm-hmm. build music when it's just that piano. I will listen to that again and again. You know what's funny is there's Hallmark movies that are licensing that that music. Shut up! They use Sims music. I was watching reality shows use it too. Yeah, it'll just be like yeah, and then people are just like walking around in the villa or whatever. I'm like, this is from The Sims Three. Like, why did they have this? I guess they even go back to Sims One and take that music. I mean, cheap to license. The Sims is just a reality show turned into a game, I suppose, in some ways. It's Big Brother. Just watch people in the house. But I was thinking about Sims One. The the weirdo neighbor guy, neighbor, neighbor family, Mortimer Goth. Was that that dude's mm-hmm. name? The in, Goth. In the fancy house. Are we oh, going to get into the goth. lore of the Goths right now? Is there a lot of... Do we have eight hours? Well, my, <laughs> my weird perspective is I never got into a Sims past Sims 1, but I spent hundreds of hours in Sims 1. So like, did Mortimer Goth... Sims 2 is the best one. Is that right? Yes. Sarah, do you what concur? Do you think, I'm like, I'm the only one who has the controversial opinion of liking Sims 3 because I like the open world. That's even fair. though it Sims ran like garbage. Does slap but the but open Sims world really animations? Like. like when you make a grilled yeah. cheese in the Sims Four, they're like, and it's a grilled cheese. In Sims Two, you like they pick up the bread, they put it down, they get the Ooh. butter, they put it on, they put the yeah. cheese. Sims, there was so Sims much. Sims Two effort. better than Sims Four. Sims Two, yeah, one Sims of the top Four is Sims. like Ooh. almost the worst one, questionably. <laughs> Does Sims Three run well now? I'm, I did download all the entirety of Sims 3 off the EA store in a sale, which yeah. it was still like $200. Um, mm. oh, and I did have to download a mod so it would run better because apparently in the Sims 3, because it's open world, they take taxis everywhere. 
dogs can take taxis. I was literally at the park and a taxi rolled up and a dog got out. <laughs> That's, perfect. That's perfect. So the mod has to run and like clean up all the trash that the game keeps creating, like taxis for dogs. <laughs> That's Whenever I hear someone talk about how The Sims runs poorly, which is often because I think generally people who play the sims do not have like gaming pcs they're they're kind of like my one game is the sims and i'm gonna play it on my laptop it's always like it runs really poorly i have downloaded 1000 mods that add <laughs> you know, a million pieces of extra clothing but like it runs like <laughs> <laughs> yeah i um with the sims one i was thinking about uh at the strong museum of play in new york they have uh, Will Wright, the designers, his original notebooks when he was designing The Sims 1. Ooh. And I went there and shot a video of them like leafing through all the notebooks. You can see just like his scribbling notes about like, okay, here's how the bathroom should work. And here's like the sound effects. I think we should have the bathroom. Just like pages and pages of him talking about like, The Sims bathroom etiquette and stuff. And it's fun because like, like just he was really into horoscopes at the time, which I don't even think made the cut in Sims 1. Are there no, horoscopes? No, they did. Because oh, they yeah, yeah. do the personalities. It assigns them like a horoscope. Okay. And then if you tweak with them, it'll change your your sign. Like if you go, oh, I want them to be angry, it'll be like boom, and it'll change what your sign is. Oh God, yeah. So he's just had pages and pages of like horoscopes and who would match with who and all this stuff. Um, and then like in the earliest uh, pages of his notebooks, designing the Sims, he wrote down like, okay, the models for what I'm going for are Mule and Monopoly. Like take those two games. Have you ever heard of the game Mule, Sarah? We'll do it for a deepest dive sometime. It'll be really okay. great. Um, oh, anyways, but like, take the studios. To. But then he wrote down uh, that he wants it to be a, and look, gender roles, uh, there's a lot to unpack here, but he said he wants this game to be a dollhouse for boys and a strategy game for girls. Like that was his Venn diagram he was trying to create with The Sims 1. That's so, interesting. Yeah, man, he kind of did it. Um, so yeah, we did have- he, a, And he didn't see a bunch of people just like making their friends and killing them in horrible ways? I guess not. Although he wrote down for like different jobs, he wrote down like homelessness and serial killer. And I forget if those are jobs in The Sims 1 to have either no, of those no. full-time occupations. Uh, but yeah, you can check it out on Game Informer's YouTube channel if you want to see those notebooks. Just search for That's Will Wright cool. notebooks or whatever on there. But so is there- is I there need a, him to explain the vibrating heart bed. Mm, I don't think That's you want to do it. Where you had to it. put like 25 simoleons in and then the bed would vibrate. Yeah, it's mm. some twisted stuff. Lots to unpack oh my there. god, remember the cutscenes in Sims 2 and then whenever you wanted them to woohoo, there would be a cutscene and my yeah. family computer was in like where my you parents were. You kind of have were. to stand in front of the family computer so your family wouldn't walk past because they <laughs> always like, would when they were woohooing yes! and you're like, don't look. And like, so I just want them to have a kid. I'm not even being a little pervert about it. I just want yeah. them to have a kid and my mom would be cooking and I'm like waiting for the phone to ring or something. You guys turn like, like the volume all the way down so nobody yeah. hears it. Exactly. It was such a embarrassing thing to go through. Mm. But, you know, if they woohooed enough and a kid came out, maybe that could be a child of the sun, just like Children of the Sun from Devolver Digital here, the Jacob Keller. The are on fire today. We can't yeah, acknowledge I, them. A game where you snipe hundreds of people. Great, you what? <laughs> great pivot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Children of the Sun. Uh, I booted this up, Jacob, did a quick stream of it. Um, this feels like the most something rotten game ever made. Yes, correct. We've had it on our radar for a long time. Okay, well, nice. how would you describe Children of the Sun? It's um, it's sniping Ape Out. I think is weirdly nice. my, but like where Ape Out is kind of like, oh, overwhelming jazz art style. Children of the Sun is like overwhelming kind of like psychedelic freak out, uh, where it's like. Colors are weird. Uh, explosions of blood, you know, spouting from every person you hit. The music is really, it's like, I don't even know if I would say music. It's like sound design. It's just the most it's oppressive. It's just kind of like unfiltered noise that's like, yeah, whenever you're doing anything. Um, At the title screen, but, when you boot it up, like your character just licks her gun. It's like, all right, this is, <laughs> I don't know what the hell <laughs> this tone is. Yeah, it's definitely going for like freaky, uh, yeah. and I and I think it pulls it off because the game itself then is very fun because the game is just, um, it's I'm trying to think of like what an analogy would be. It's I'm kind of super sure, but, hot feely, right? Well, kind of, but like it's you just you have one bullet. And every time you hit someone, you can redirect that bullet. And so it's just kind of like, all right, there are six dudes kind of walking around, you know, the bottom of an underpass. Yeah. Just take them all out. And so it's kind of a puzzle game in terms of like, okay, if 
if I go here, I can get around the corner and then I can get this guy who's standing in the office and then I can go through the window and hit him. Um, and it, it introduces more variables in terms of like, uh, you know, some people have a shield, so you have to hit them from behind. And some people you have to like accelerate the bullet. So you need like a longer wind up. But it's really it is kind of super hotty in that they're like very self-contained levels that are kind of built for high score chasing, because I okay. think you can play them once and just get through and have a good time like that. But like, I think there's probably a lot of depth in terms of like, well, technically you could do it in this angle, but if you do it in, in from this order, you're going to get, you know, like four times the points or you can get like three guys at once. And that's a, that'll get you a big bonus or something. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of the Far Cry 3 thing where you do the encampments and you'd have to kill everyone in a certain order. And there was like, there was an order you should do it in to make it easier, but you could do it any way you wanted. And if they got, it kind of reminds me of that. And yeah. you can, you, you do kind of like tag people before you do it. Like the controls are so weird because it's, it's literally just mouse. Like there is, there is no keyboard at all. But so even if you're like you start and you're controlling the sniper, but you're just running in this big circle around the place that you're shooting at. And so you literally just like move the mouse right or left and your person runs in that direction. And then you can stop and kind of tag everyone so you can see them when then you've shot your bullet and your bullet is like bouncing all around this environment. Yeah. Is it frustrating like i was having to retry a lot because i would just get kind of i'd hit a dead end of like okay well i went into the house and i shouldn't have gotten into the house i guess just retry and now try a different it's, path and mark them yada 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 it's definitely a retry heavy game yeah. that's that's kind of a category in itself but like they're instantaneous you know it's like you never have to kind of wait for anything and so i certainly did retry levels a lot but it's like the time it takes to get back into the action is like two seconds, you know, only in the very last couple levels did I have some frustration and like, oh, I have to do this whole big sequence before I can, you know, do this. Yeah. Uh, how much do you like this game? Is it a cool novelty or is it something sp more special than that? Somewhere between those two. Sure. I think it's I think it's a really neat. It does not emotionally speak to me, um, you know, like I think. I think it is mostly a demonstration of really cool aesthetics, yeah. but like, that's great. You know, like that, that is totally enough for this, which is like probably two and a half hours and like $15, you oh, know, it's Jesus. like, okay. Yeah. It, it's like, it's well worth the kind of the price of admission. Yeah. Children of the sun is the name of that whole thing. Um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Haley, you went back to Pokemon red. I was right there. The sun is a big ball of fire and aliens <laughs> playing fire red. Uh, she's doing it. Uh, okay. I know you talked about this on bonus pod uh, yeah. with your friend, but what the hell is this radical red? Is that what it's called? Radical red. It's a ROM hack that just recently got the 4.0 update, which is kind of why everyone's talking about it right now. There was okay. a fun when I was streaming it last night. There's a lot of questions like, why is everyone playing this? Like, it feels like it's an old thing, but it's just because it just got updated. And I've never played any of the previous versions or anything like that before, but I've heard that it just works a lot better now. The AI is a lot better. Everything works better. Um, but yeah, like to boil it down to just what it is, it's every generation of Pokemon in Fire Red with their sprites and animations in there and all that kind of stuff. And um, the AI is really smart. So it's so freaking hard. It's so hard. It's like everyone you're playing is a competitive Pokemon real person. And it's not just an NPC who you could just fireball to death and move on. Like I was getting my ass handed to me in Viridian Forest, which is supposed to be just Caterpie. Boom, boom, boom. Just like <laughs> kill them and move on. Yeah. They all have amazing strategies it, and it makes it really fun to play. What what could they be doing? They're just using like high level moves. But I mean, how many moves could they really have if you just have like a level six Caterpie or whatever? So what also is fun is it won't just be like, you know, just the original 150 Pokemon in the grass. Like it has all nine generation Pokemon. So you could potentially find some really good Pokemon early. And there's also level caps. So you can only be level 15 until you beat Brock. So even though like you might, you, you know, you can't grind up and have your starter be level 25 before you go see Brock and just like dummy Brock, even if he's a different typing matchup than you. It's like, no, I'm at 15. My, you know, Froakie's at 15. That's all he's going to be when I fight Brock. So I can't use that strategy of, of boosting him up. 
And then, you know, you'll encounter, like, there was this one girl in the forest and she had this stuffle who should just be, like, a two-shot and I move on. And I could not kill her f- stuffle. <laughs> it was, try- it, like, was an hour and a half of the stream was trying Whoa. to kill this one stuffle. And I was going in looking for Pokemon that would be a good counterbalance to what she was doing. And what's really fun is if when you lose to them, they remember how you played. So the next no. time I come out, Speaking she knows that I chuck out a certain Pokemon first and she already was countering that. And then, so I died again. And the next time I come out, she knows that I like to swap quickly to this new Pokemon I have on my team. She counters that with another swap. That's the opposite typing. And I was like, this girl's a savant. She's a genius. She's just an NPC on in Viridian Forest. Whoa. Like she's just nobody. I haven't even gotten to Brock yet. And I streamed over three hours last night, like trying my hardest to do this. And yeah, her strategy was crazy. She had like, uh, <laughs> like she was so smart. She just everything I did, she did the opposite. She like they swap out Pokemon a lot more. You know how usually yeah. NPCs, even if I if they have a grass and I change to my Charmander, they'll just sit there and take it. They're like, oh no, like they'll just let their Pokemon die. But the, the AI just immediately swaps to like a Water type. It's like nope, and it it will do like what a real human being would do. So I have no idea how the Leaf Four is gonna go. It's like everyone's Cynthia. But smarter. <laughs> this essentially. sounds like a nightmare. Because like my Pokemon <laughs> strategy is like I only use the attack moves. Any kind of like I buff or debuff yep. move, it's like immediately in the trash. Like yes, I'm and I only get like the cute Pokemon, so they all kind of suck a little bit. And it's like this sounds like I don't know. It's, I, it's good, all- good for you, Haley. You will persevere. <laughs> it, I'm the exact same way, and this is almost because then I play competitive. Like, we'll do, I'll do games with my friends who are actually do competitive, like Brian, who I had on Bonus Pod, and yeah. he dummies me. And I think I need to play it this way to learn how Brian thinks because I am totally the fireball, fireball delete mm-hmm. all the status effect things until I beat the Elite Four, but I can't do that anymore, so it's forcing me to learn all these other strategies and stuff. Like, I, normally I get supersonic off of a Pokemon. I'm like, I need supersonic, because I need to confuse that freaking Watt Troll or whatever it's called, because all of it, it absorbs all my electricity attacks, so I can't use electricity. It's dumbing my ice Pokemon, so I need to confuse it at least, and it's, like, making me change the way I play Pokemon, and it, that's, it maybe sounds like that's not fun, but it's fun when you, when you finally beat that Dumb girl outside of the forest. I was Her like, stuffle. Yes! Like, it actually never felt look at rewarding. a stuffle the same way. <laughs> exactly. And now I'm like looking forward to Brock. I'm like, do I just go I don't like and fish everywhere for a few hours before I go fight Brock just to have a stacked water Pokemon team that I could then carry forward into the next area? Should I need more water Pokemon? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm using Pokemon I never use. I usually just choose the cute ones. It's like, no, I need to mm-hmm. use this Toad School, even though I hate him and he looks ugly because he is good status effect moves and i need that right now so it's kind of what what is the um oh what's it called the way to play pokemon that's more hardcore we have to stick with the pokemon you catch yada 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 uh, nuzlocke Nuzlocke? yeah so this is just like an extension of nuzlocke in some ways of just like let's remix pokemon to make it more fun and engaging here yeah it's just like you know how people impose their own challenges when they play elden ring or something like that it's kind of like that but you're not imposing it the game's forcing it on you like so you have to just try to beat radical red I'm on normal. I'm not even being too crazy about it. There's also randomizers you can put, so every Pokemon could be random. Um, and it could have random stats, random moves and stuff. But at yeah. that point, I'm like, I can't even predict what's going to happen. I'd rather beat it where the Pokemon are acting like what they're supposed to do. Right. And the, the Pokemon are relatively making sense and where they're showing up and stuff. Like, I don't just get a legendary in the opening grass or something like that. It is such a fun idea of taking, like, the competitive Pokemon scene, <clears throat> which is so hardcore, and they've boiled it down to like these are the moves that you need, um, a lot of status play, swapping it out, all that stuff, and then to take that intensity and be like, can we squeeze that back into single player Pokemon and good luck? Yeah. Um, but yeah, Tommy Ostrenga wrote in and they say, not a question, but I applaud you, Haley, if you can beat Radical Red. I had the single most insane down to the wire win a few years back, and I'll always, I will always remember my time with that game. That's fun. I, yeah, I, I want to keep playing it. There's so many other things I should be playing, but my my brain is like, keep playing Radical Red. <laughs> it's also just, that game's so nostalgic. I have yeah. such warm feelings of every inch of Pokemon Red and Fire Red. I played those games to death. So it's also just being like, oh, the forest. I remember being in my bed and playing this and hiding <laughs> under the sheets. Like, it just feels good to play that way too. Yep, totally. But yeah, Pokemon Rattle Red, Radical Red, not an official release, a fan-made project that you can find out there if you really want to. But yeah, that's, like that's some, I opened an email, just downloaded on my computer. I don't know how it got there. And that's then it opened wonderful. itself and I started playing by mistake. It was it's weird. It's really great when that happens. Um, hey, Red to Yellow, 
Kill a fellow, save a podcast. That's right, everybody. Yellow Taxi Goes Vroom. Um, this game is out now, and the very easy pitch for Yellow Taxi Goes Vroom is it's Crazy Taxi meets Mario 64. It's uh, 70% Mario 64, 30% Crazy Taxi would be my breakdown, Jacob. Uh, do you concur? Yeah, I mean, it. Is it Crazy Taxi only in that you are literally controlling a car that is a taxi? Also, there's some missions where people want you to, like, drive you to from point A to point B, like, drive okay. me underwater and all that stuff. So it's kind of in the DNA there, I suppose. But it's a lot more just... Yeah, but it's... I think it's like, imagine a platformer where you're a car. Yes. What if there, what if there was a platformer where you were a car, is the pitch. But then also the part that surprises me jumping into a game like this is that, like, imagine there's a platformer where you're a car... But it controls well. Like, it feels like it'd be really annoying, but it's like the best. I mean, look, this may be hyperbole, so everyone relax, please. But I mean, it might be the best controlling, like, arcade vehicle in any game ever. <laughs> just for, like, wow. the tightness of that control. But it's not like a big racing game, but just like arcadey, over the top car controls. Like, it. It feels a lot better than I would think it would. And there's not like a yeah, jump. I, it's just like a boost that you get and all this stuff that you can kind of learn to finesse. I, I haven't played very much of it. It is so it's like, yeah, the, the hook is like you can't jump. You know, you can yeah. go off ramps and you can go faster. And so that can make you go further and you can kind of propel yourself forward. But you don't have any way to get yourself up. Um, I've certainly run into a number of like... Okay, I have to use my boost at this time, but I'm consistently overshooting or undershooting just because I don't quite know how far it's going to take me, which I'm sure would go away uh, as I played more of it. But like it is it does not feel like other games, which is right. cool, but like it's. It, platformer skills are not going to immediately translate of like, oh, I'm good at Mario, so I can be good at Yellow Taxi. Yeah, totally. Even if there's a lot of Mario in there. And like, you know, the I think it's the second world is just like their take on Bob on Battlefield, where it's just like, okay, just seeing an indie game go for the structure of a level, like, okay, we'll have the big mountain on top, but then a ton of little basically stars you can collect on your way there and stuff, like, except in this game, they're, they're gears and whatnot. But I, I hear you with, you know, every once in a while, feeling frustrated by the controls, but I assume that if you're really good at this game, you can annihilate this stuff, because you can, like, slow down oh, yeah. and speed up in air and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think a speed run of this game would look unbelievable, yeah. you know, in terms of what they were doing. And then, also, we should mention, it, like, the aesthetics of this game, as well as Children of the Sun, are an equal level of in your face in a completely different direction, where it's like, what if someone just turned every dial in like banjo kazooie up to 11 yes where it's just like everything is so loud and flashy and has different animations and like you're just running into people at full speed to talk to them and then their speech <laughs> bubbles are like popping up in the middle of the screen and it's like yeah. it is really it's a lot there's just like a lot going on at all times yeah it's like as obnoxious as a pizza tower even if it looks nothing like a pizza tower but it has that like <laughs> yeah. intensity to it in some ways yeah but the environments i think are sweet though it's like little bedrooms gas stations like if you like yeah N64 there's like a heineken-esque you know thing where yeah. it's just like oh i guess i'm just going around like a big house and that's fun because you're a car right right and i think it's just on steam right now but yeah yellow taxi goes vroom is the name of that thing and we do have codes to give away uh for trivia tower which is coming up on monday april 22nd if you want to compete in trivia tower you can win a code for yellow taxi goes vroom there on steam um sarah oh sarah do you know how this whole thing operates patreon it's Patreon, everybody. Patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. You go to that URL, you find the tier that's right for you, something that's sustainable for you, and that keeps this whole independent outlet running. I promise there's a benefit in there that you'll enjoy. That $2 tier, you can compete in game trivia this Monday with Trivia Tower. And then $5 tier, you can get the ad-free version of this podcast. So you don't have to hear this segment of the podcast each and every week. Can you imagine anything as luxurious as that? And also you get it a day early. We don't really point that out too much, but that's an option for you. If you're interested, thank you to some of our biggest supporters. Special thank you to folks like Aura. Uh, hey, Jacob Geller. 
Do you ever um, Google yourself and it's not just people saying, what a genius, the greatest YouTuber known to man, but instead it's like, there's some personal information on the internet I, I wish wasn't here. Is it ever the case for you? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, that is the case. Why don't you recite the ways uh, in which that's the case? Well, Jacob Keller- They have I my height wrong, Ben. Wait, do they really? <laughs> there's a thing called Wikitubia that is just like a user submitted, like put any YouTuber on here and it has me at one inch shorter than my actual height and it bothers and so you funny and then whenever i say my actual height my partner says i don't know on wikitubia <laughs> <your face." laughs> how did they like guess it would this like i don't know i'm sure you're just I, eyeballing I, it I, yeah. i'm sure that it was like I, I, I don't know. It's like, there are so many kind of like, they're all very sourced. And it's like, Jacob was on a stream 10 years ago. And he said, uh, you know, I guess I'm the same height as this person. And then that person was 5'6". And so it has me as 5'6". I'm so sorry for your loss of an inch. Uh, well, Aura can help you out. Maybe not necessarily with that, Jacob. But the idea is there's a lot more information than you want uh, online about yourself. And so Aura will show you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests for all of those data brokers. You know um, how Liara was the shadow broker, Jacob, in Mass Effect? Yes. Yeah, but imagine if she was a data broker and more evil than she was in that DLC. So uh, I'm imagining it. Okay, well then you need Aura. If you're imagining Mass Effect, you need Aura. Cleaning up online information not only helps reduce the amount of spam you get, but it protects from hackers who could use the information to help them access social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping folks safe so you can focus on other tasks with a complete peace of mind. So you can value your privacy, everybody. Go to uh, aura.com slash minmax to start your two week free trial. That's aura.com slash minmax to start your two week free trial. There's a link in the description if you're interested in checking out Aura. Also, thank you to our dear friends at I Am 8 Bit. They want everybody to know about the Vampire Survivors Volume 1 vinyl soundtrack. Nothing better that than art this. Is rad. The art is rad. I Am 8 Bit is rad. Uh, if you like a blood red vinyl album to celebrate uh, Vampire Survivors, I Am 8 Bit is the place to be. Go to I Am 8 Bit's wonderful online store. I dare you to not be impressed. If you are a uh, person with dorky proclivities, I promise this will be the coolest store you can go to online. So check out I'm 8-Bit's wonderful online store. Use the promo code SHOWERPOWER, no space, SHOWERPOWER, and you get 10% off everything under $100 by checking out I'm 8-Bit's online store and using that special MinMax exclusive promo code SHOWERPOWER. Just cruise around, find something cool. I promise you can. Um, and... You should help support uh, I Am 8-Bit because they support uh, the MinMax community in a big way by shipping out a prize each and every week. Whoever has the best question submitted over there on Patreon, whoever truly makes the show better, they win the prize from I Am 8-Bit. And this week, it's the Artful Escape on Nintendo Switch, which is the I Am 8-Bit exclusive edition. So thank I Am 8-Bit by going to their store, using that promo code because they are shipping out prizes each and every week. I'm still amazed they're that generous. So help support them. Okay, you ready for these community questions? Yeah. Great. Sean Rubin writes in and says, Congratulations, um, Haley, Sarah, Jacob. You have each won a chance to win $1 million. You've already won. Uh, 1,000 random humans will be selected from anywhere in the world. You get to decide on any competition you prefer. And if you come in first place against all 1,000 people, you win. What is your choice of competition? Look, I know this is a big setup, but basically a thousand random people, what do you have the best chance of beating them at? Let's see. Lately, I've been doing a lot of Minnesota native gardening. Oh. So I think oh. if it was a Minnesota native plants identification, yes. I would nice. rock it. Because okay. a thousand people from anywhere, like where are the chances are from Minnesota and they're into native pollinator gardens. That's really smart. You've overthought it, but in the correct way. Um, what do we got? <laughs> what, what are number one Minnesota plants? What are you working with? Um, well, I really like, let's see, the one that I'm planting right now is like sundial lupin. I'm really excited for lupin. Ooh. It's apparently like the only host for like the Carner blue butterfly. So I started that from seeds. I've got some bee balm. I've got some lance leaf coreopsis. I got a lot of ooh butterfly milkweed. Ooh, that's beautiful. So excited for that this year. Oh so yeah, like, are awesome. 
I'm on top of it. Jesus. Do you think there's any universe you'd be doing this if it wasn't for Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley getting into your life? Honestly, Ben, yeah. I was planting my garden yesterday and I was thinking about that. Is it like, is it that I'm into gardening because I grew up playing Harvest Moon? Or was I always into gardening and that's why I started liking Harvest no Moon? Way. I really don't. I don't know which direction it goes, but we're really into it now. That's sweet. That's that's smart. I was thinking like video games may be the most obvious route for a competition like that. And you want to go something a little bit obscure. So if it did like Amplitude on PS2 multiplayer, I could beat a thousand random people. Perfect Dark, I could probably beat a thousand random people. A thousand people though? I, yeah. I think this is actually way easier than you think it is because it's like picture how many... Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, sold generously 10 million copies. Sure. You know, it's like that chances are you're going to be up against like maybe one person who's even played the game, you know, if right. you did it. And so and so mine mine would be like fewest deaths through Sekiro, because I think I could beat that game in like probably less than 10 deaths um Oof, wow. and, you know, hey, like, la -di -da. I, mr five foot six like, is staying I, the I number here good at that game but i think even if i was like completely mediocre at that game yeah. i would still be way better than everyone i went up against because i'm a professional video game player and most people have not played most games okay so if this sean rubin thing is real and you get a million dollars if you beat a thousand random people but if you don't get first, we saw an arm off Civil War style. Oh, we need that. <laughs> Would you still do that with Sekiro? Would you take that chance? Then you chance? can't play games, Jacob. I, I mean, I would have to think for longer about it <laughs> nope. to be like nope. one of my best. <laughs> nope. The I, windows is yeah, closing. I, I think I think there is an extremely low chance that a thousand random people selected from around the world yeah. could beat Sekiro uh, in fewer deaths than me. So you're taking that. Yeah, saw off my damn arm. Oh my god! <laughs> well, you get a cool prosthetic. It would, it would be thematically fitting. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even think about it. that. Uh, Haley, uh, law trivia. Oh no, I no. I would say painting a dog. I'm really good at painting dogs. <laughs> a picture a of a dog. People? Yes, I've painted probably 150 dogs. That's what I did during university to make extra money. Was like pet portraits. And it's just like this, and I'm not even like, I can paint other things, but something about a dog, now I've done it so many times, I'm just like, this is where that wrinkle is. This is how the nose looks. It just like takes way less time. Maybe speed painting. So I'd have even more of like a, like an hour to paint a dog on like a little canvas. I think I could muck up on that. That's smart. But at the same time, you know, art is so subjective, you know? So it's like, if someone just puts like three dots down, they're like, this is, this is the dog The as judge well. would be a, a person who likes dog portraits to look like dogs. <laughs> you don't get to choose. The judge is uh, Sean Rubin from the community, I think. So maybe if someone does a dog, but it looks like an art style, they appreciate an impressionistic dog, maybe they take it. You know, that's that's too it's tough. It's just like in, in the sawing off your arm scenario, <laughs> yes. it's like art, art is a like universal skill. You know, it's like out of a thousand people, right. I would guess that probably like 50 of them would be like decent at drawing, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's pretty high, you know, like that's all, everyone draws at some point in their life. Yeah, uh, Haley, versus it's, it's impossible you know, playing playing Pokemon <laughs> Red Psycho mode. Right. Of. right. <laughs> yeah. Somehow you have answered this hypothetical completely incorrectly. And I just feel like we need to saw off your arm Civil War style just for the punishment. <laughs> Yo, you even see it. my paintings. You're no, they're beautiful paintings. They're beautiful <laughs> paintings, but they're subjectively beautiful. That's the problem. <laughs> Thousand, maybe I'm like overestimating a thousand people being good at drawing dogs and like painting it with acrylic paint. Okay, okay. If you, look, it's your choice, you're gonna lose an arm, but I'm telling you, it's your choice, <laughs> it's fine. Um, Joe, Ch wow, Ka I thought that was gonna go well, that went way worse. <laughs> <laughs> do you think, um, initial plus, I've had it written down for a long time. I do want to do like a painting, new show plus, because I just think it'd be really like funny. A wine and sip. I guess so, but Fine. just I think it'd be funny to have somebody like at an easel painting for an hour, then at the end of the hour, like rotate it around to reveal what they painted. That That'd image fun. is funny. If I don't know if like we do like two people at once and one person you get to see him paint, the other person it's a mystery, and they're both painting the same object. Is well, and it should movie? be the person who's like not good who's yeah. you can see. Yep. You know, and so then and then like Kelsey gets to turn hers around and right. it's beautiful. Yeah. 
Um, I think it'd be fun like that. And also, I think it'd just be fun to buy a whole easel and do the whole thing. I'm going to write down painting competition dog question mark um let's see joe <laughs> also chop cats. their arms off <laughs> <laughs> uh joe kapczynski writes in how do you move on after finishing a big game i jumped around probably four or five games after finishing final fantasy 7 rebirth before i finally settled on something that didn't feel like a letdown i'm always a little worried i'll ruin whatever i try to play next by measuring it against something so significant uh, for what it's worth i settled on the new alone in the dark game which pleasantly surprised me Possibly because I had no illusions that I'd be able to stack up to Rebirth. I forgot Probably that. Either out. play something I've already played once and I know I like, or just something in it, the complete opposite genre. So I'm yeah. not thinking about it. Yep, a yellow taxi goes from is the perfect palate cleanser rebirth. after a hundred hours of being <laughs> rebirthed. Yeah, Balatro, because you get you know you get that sweet Queen's blood. Uh, reminder but also it you don't have to do side quests you just play full houses yeah that is sweet mm. the the most twisted rotten thought i've had is i'll lay awake at night and think maybe i should just start rebirth again what if i just ran that oh, entire you, thing again? Are you sick? i think it'd be you really sicko. fun i, would, I just yeah. want to know how it feels to play it without doing the side content like going for all the side content in a first playthrough, I can just tell you that when I play it, because there's yeah, not going to be enough time for me to play all those. And Jacob, you're pretty close. It feels, it feels like a game that uh, doesn't have pacing, rather than a game where you have killed its pacing. Mm, okay, <laughs> because because mm. there's still nothing that happens in those story missions. But How? when you do all those side missions, you're like, maybe it's me. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to paint a painting of all the amazing things that happen in the story missions and finally read the really uh-huh. you're telling me this isn't something jacob this seems like a big deal that's happening right now i think so too and then none of the characters ever talk about it again what? which i know goes with your theory that it's a game about characters not talking about things it is yeah, number one theory yeah so everything is uh defensible i think Sarah, but what? it gave us the bow wow wow song so i feel like <laughs> I it was worth something at least yeah what's what's your journey with rebirth sarah how far are you are you gonna keep going where are you at i threw it away after i finished costa del sol what i said you know what i've seen enough whoa <laughs> I really liked um, being on my little tiny scooter, though. That was yeah. really great. That was a high for me. I, Sarah, look, you what? do you. The next location you go to is the Gold Saucer. If you don't do any of this open world content around Costa del Sol, right? They already made me do a Queen's Blood tournament to get off a boat. You could have skipped it. You could have forfeited it I know, but like, you know, then they'd be like, you skipped it. They would have told you that you skipped it, no doubt. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, Sarah. I, I beg of thee. If you just, you have to make it to the opening cutscene when you get to Gold Saucer. It's... It is truly a delight. And even Jacob's nodding. Yeah. It's good. And you're you're right there. You're right there. It's gonna be so good. But, but then I can stop after that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. And I, I don't wanna get hopes too high, but like if you like Final Fantasy X 2, going to Gold Saucer, Sarah, is gonna be very up your alley. So just just get there. Just get to that cutscene. The says Sephiroth is very hot in that cutscene, Sarah. That's true. The entire the entire Final Fantasy Seven for the rebirth for me yeah. was like Pokemon Snap. Sephiroth edition because he kind of like jump scares you with his hotness like he comes out of nowhere a lot so I had my finger on that pause button at any moment that I like there might be a Sephiroth hiding you should see my PlayStation 5 photos Ben there's like 50 photos plus of Sephiroth like it's all Sephiroth shot. I want to go through Sarah's Sephiroth folders with her new show plus. Jesus. Uh, that's it basically looks like a mode psychopath's snap. PlayStation 5. Uh, well, the good news is he pops in every 16 minutes, I think, through that game just to remind you that he exists. So uh, he's basically there all the time anyway. Um, Mitch Crossan writes in with a very thematically appropriate question. Is Tifa's hair considered a ponytail? Can I, I want to Google Tifa. I, I thumbs this up because I don't know the answer and I want someone to tell me. So it's like, it is a ponytail, but it's like, at it's at the very bottom that there's a little tie around it. Sarah? Uh, I would say no, because a ponytail, it assumes that like the hair is being tied back higher up on the head. Is, that a th- uh, is there a I name? Would, for- I would describe Tifa's as long tied together at the end. Um, like there's huh, not a good that classic name for hairstyle. it. <laughs> because it's not because nobody would wear that hairstyle. Like the only time I've seen that hairstyle is historically women sleeping in it. Like that's yeah. it. Like I've never seen an actual person go out and try to wear it because mm. the thing would just slip off. 
It yeah. just doesn't make any sense. I'll be devil's hairstyle. advocate and say, I think that's a ponytail. As long as it's the not shape a of the hair creates a pony's tail. What? It's, it's like it's this made. long! Yeah, a little baby pony. But at the <laughs> end... But it's not it's not pre it's not only post elastic it could also be pre elastic to count towards. But if pony you said shape. Tifa is a girl with a ponytail and then you put a lineup of women, people wouldn't pick Tifa because it looks like her hair's down. But it's what just if, lazy. What if it, as long as you can see the elastic, you're like that's. I a wouldn't ponytail. even call it a low pony. It's like a nubbins. Oof. Um, wow! Can I just say when you when you Google Tifa Lockhart hair, you get a bunch of fan art of her with short hair and like Square Enix put this in the game. Yeah, they tumble <laughs> yeah. back. I've seen that too. It looks way better. Uh, Prosia number six says, "Hey Ben and friends, what's something you have intimate knowledge of that makes it hard for you to suspend your disbelief in media?" As we all know from the inaugural Doc Lightning uh, short documentary film festival from last year, when train cars become uncoupled, they lose the air in their brakes and would come grinding to a halt. Yet countless games and movies have train cars detaching left and right. But what's something that you know too well so every time you see it in media, it bumps you? Contract law probably now. <laughs> favorite uh, subgenre of films is contract law films. <laughs> well, if there's always like a contract or something, right? It's like, I'll be like, there's no consideration that would be valid. Like, it's just like, like stuff like that. Like, uh, that acceptance is kind of sketchy that you can probably devoid that contract between Shrek and the Rumpel Skiltskin or whatever the hell Shrek yeah. 4. What I about that recently? I what about like, the one eh. that uh, Ursula makes Ariel sign? Is that binding, you think? Um, you could maybe argue she didn't have enough time to review the terms before yeah. she signed. Like she was pressured into signing quickly because of all the music and and magic about. <laughs> because of the music <laughs> under duress from the light show. Yeah, exactly. From flotsam and jetsam, they were giving her the side eye. It's no good. <laughs> I I used to work a lot with like surveys, kind of like when you're doing like a, a clinical study, how you have to administer a survey to people. And it's like, that that's a very specific thing. But like, you do see kind of people are like, I'm doing a study in movies or TV. And it's like, they are never getting like the proper uh, permissions and like telling people their rights and what they can do with that study. Oh boy. Uh, let's it's see. It's boring. It's sorry. Boring. Apparently. Uh, ooh, who is this? Tom, Rickard says, hey, folks, uh, missed joke opportunity here. That is unfortunately just a pun. Uh, you're pushing it, buddy. Um, when all you last week were talking about Jeff Keeley, um, Janet said, we're reading the tea leaves when she should have said we're reading the key leaves. Oh. Anyways, what is the longest you've been stuck on a boss in the game? I once got so stuck on the final boss in Bloodborne uh, that to save my sanity, I limited myself to one try a day and it took me an entire year oh my god oh my god sorry you're losing an arm dude sorry tom this uh, isn't a boss but there was an elephant character in persona 5 on this on the i don't want to i don't know if telling where the what are those things called that they go to and they're all different places oh it's been a while since i paid persona 5 the first one's the castle. The, the mind palaces. Mind palaces. Called. But we can call them mind palaces. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, spoiler for where one of the mind palaces is, is a space station. And uh, this elephant. And I did the math on, on why I kept losing to him. Because it just kept happening. And I realized it was just luck. Like, I just would have to luck myself past this elephant. I, oh, God. For one of our game query zines, I wrote, like, a several-page piece about what I did to try to beat this one elephant and just like without having to go back eight or something hours because I was stupid in my save file. And I think it added two something years to my playthrough for so long because I just <laughs> couldn't get past this one elephant. Not a not a boss, just just a guy I was fighting in the hallway. And just the way that his attacks stacked together means it was just a roll of the dice that some things would hit, some things wouldn't. He'd target Joker instead of somebody else. And that I'd be like, oh, I lose. Like, doesn't matter what happens. If he targets Joker in the next turn, I lose. And it was, I just mm. did it until I finally beat him. And then I could save and get my SP back up to get through that area. Yuck. I don't say it to be uh, Mimi, but uh, Sans Undertale. Uh, like, oh. that boss is really, yeah. really hard. Oh, hard. I think I, 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 I remember... It's kind of freeing to know that you're just going to be stuck on a boss all day. But I remember like one day <laughs> just being like, I'm going to do this for the next like five hours. Like I'm just going to like try and memorize this fight. And I eventually got through it. But it was like it was a whole day. Oh, God. Yeah, I think um, 
playing Metal Gear Solid 2 on Extreme, the Metal Gear Ray fight was maybe the hardest because there's like 40 of them or something. It, it is just ridiculous what they make you go through to fight that fight. Uh, but the good news is that it's freaking sweet still. Uh, Kyle Silva writes in and says, Miss joke opportunity. Uh, when Ben wanted to clarify that Janet was referring to a real life physical version of Pong with the term Pong standum, Ben should have said, I heard Pong standum will be an NPC in Star Wars Outlaws. Yeah, I should I should have said that guy. That podcast would have been better. As someone who doesn't listen to the podcast, what was going on on the last podcast? Uh, well, you'll understand for this one. Jonah, missing a lot of jokes. <laughs> Jonah yeah, Abraham was... writes in and says, "Miss joke opportunity in the last podcast. Instead of doing la- last week's podcast, you and the crew should have simply done the Roche 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 chant for the entire duration on the show. That was that's on us, Jonah. I, I apologize. Um, Sam Worms writes in and says, "Miss joke opportunity <laughs> last week when discussing a show where you'd predict uh, what games Jeff Keighley would show at Summer Game Fest." Janet said, "We'll have to read the tea leaves," and she should have said, "We should have read the key leaves." Yeah, that was apparently such a layup. Multiple people <laughs> wrote in about reading the key leaves. No, <laughs> we actually- blew it. Uh, so Sly Cut writes in and says, "Hey everybody, what'd y'all do on your first date?" I assume in our lives. Who thumb? Did anyone thumbs this? <laughs> I did. I saw no thumbs, so Haley, it's interesting that it's showing. Yeah, Haley, you have to Haley, say give it. a big thumbs up. Oh, okay, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I went to Subway and we got a sub down on the waterfront because we were in high school and we were poor, and then we just walked along the waterfront, which was nice. And then he lived really far away and he walked me all the way home, which was very nice because I knew he then had to walk all the way back to his house. Wow. And I was like, that's very sweet. And then we hugged and that was it. That's beautiful. And you yeah. reeked of Subway in the best, most romantic way possible. I did not get red onions on my sub if that's what you're asking, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Perfect. I think like my first real date in high school was going to 50 First Dates, the Adam Sandler movie. Oh. I'm thinking like, oh, this is cool. Hey, this is a good first day, right? So I spent most I watched, of the first day convincing them that it was a genius idea for a first date. I watched that movie recently, and I wow, do. that movie is different, though, when you're older, because it's just like this woman is suffering from short-term memory loss, and he's just using it to try to get with her. And I was like, oh, wait, that actually is kind of awful when I think about it long-term. But as a kid, I was like, romantic as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it uh, on the way back from Hawaii because... I went to like the Jurassic Park Valley where they shot like the Gallimima scene or whatever. And they had a big list of all the movies that were shot there. And oh. one of them was 50 First Dates. I'm like, I don't even remember that. So I had to scrub through the movie and watch it again to look out for the scene where they're actually in the Jurassic Park Valley, which is fun. Um, Lurch Jordan says, no question here. I just want to say that the pod's knife is a 10 out of 10 emote and I use it all the time. So congratulations, Sarah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Andrew uh, Klobber writes in and says, Hey, Max crew. On the topic of The Sims, it was recently announced that Margot Robbie and her production company are making a Sims movie with Loki season one director Kate Heron directing and co-writing with Brioni Redman. Got me wondering, what angle are they going to take for the story? I learned this yesterday because my partner angrily shouted it up the stairs. <laughs> she said, they're making a Sims movie. <laughs> Somebody and stop said, them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she also, Margot Robbie also is producing some other movie that's another... Monopoly. Adap- is it? Okay. I think really? so. Where it's just like, all right, she's the queen of adapting toy-like things now. Have well, at there's it, also a Hot Wheels movie, a Polly Pocket movie, a Magic 8-Ball movie. Uno. So, like, this is, yeah, not Uno. I would have known about that. But Ooh. we're in, like, a whole new frontier of just forced IP movies. Great. Mm. Um, the Sims movie. Is there any way to do it without, I'm being teleported into the world of The Sims, look out! I thought they were going to do like a, like a, oh, I feel like my life is being controlled and I'm trying to escape fate. Right. Thing. But that's oh, just see, basic- I want them to do like the lore of The Sims, but just make it like a crazy drama. And you know, like those movies that are Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve, where at the end you learn everyone's related? Because that's what The Sims lore is about. Like this person's nephew is this guy who broke off and had a kid and then died. Really? Like, oh, they're related? What the hell? So you could do like the whole Bella Goss story with Mortimer and all that alien nonsense that happens. Like, the craziness, yeah. the pleasant view plot, and just make it like Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve style. Everybody comes together at the end. That would low key be a really good movie that I would watch. Do you think it has to start with them speaking Simlish and then it slowly zooms in and zooms back out and there, it translates to English? Kind of like, like with Avatar. Really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> speaking like the Navi language. Yep. And then it just pops. Ben, you were absolutely thinking of 
what's that submarine movie? Hunt for Red October. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, yeah. Yes, Sarah, I'm so sorry that. to do this. A pa- February 4th, 2021, Lil Yachty developing action heist movie based on card game Uno. Uh, oh, no. My guess is it's dead. It wasn't one of the ones announced post Barbie, but I Googled Uno movie because I thought I had heard of it. And there was a news story at some point. Whoa. Uh, not an active development when you were at Marvel or not Marvel. What is the name of that company? Mattel. Mattel. Sarah, thank you. Um, I feel like it's it, it'll just kind of be like the Lego movie, maybe where yeah. it'll, it feels like it'll kind of be like a conversation with God movie where they'll be like, mm. I feel like someone's controlling us. And yep. then yep. they'll talk to God. It would Look. be so good as a horror movie, though. Like, imagine, Ooh. like, trying to escape and then all of a sudden getting put in a pool and the ladder's deleted and you just don't know what to do. Like, I can't you're crawl over the side. You're brushing in the kitchen sink and you're like, what am yeah. I doing? <laughs> you're stargazing and a satellite just falls on you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, Travis and Fargo says, why is it called a laundromat and not a laundry mat? Yeah, someone needs to get on that. I don't know if that's a good campaign platform. What's a romat? Romat? Yeah. What's that? What are the words being combined? Laundry and what? I don't even know. I just accepted it. Romat. It's American. It's an American thing. Can I tell you my version of that? Messenger. What, what is a message? Where does the end come from? Messenger? <laughs> messenger? Mes- messenger. Uh, that's a, yeah, that is weird. It's like anti venom for curing snake venom. It's like, what? what? Snake it- no, that's no, it's anti venom. No, I think it's anti venom. It's anti venom. It's definitely anti venom. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, see, I'm right because it says also known as anti venom. Okay, well, Black when I search anti-venom, person, it says showing it. results for anti-venom. <laughs> Look, Wikipedia, it says it's anti-venom. First and foremost. Second and well, second most. The Wikipedia Wikipedia is, it does say that. Uh-huh. Like the Wikipedia page is called anti-venom. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. Uh, Juan One writes in and says, Hey, Min Max, there's been a big discourse on weekly release versus binge release for shows. Uh, the big shows bringing this discourse up are Fallout TV, which was released on one day, and X-Men 97, which is a weekly show. What do y'all, what do y'all prefer? I think reality TV, weekly's fine, because I like to read the online drama yeah. that goes on between sure. each week. Sure. But if it's like pre-recorded, like a Bridgerton, you need to give it to me immediately because I am going to gorge myself on it. Like, do not yeah. make me wait. 100% agree with Sarah. Anything but reality My enjoyment goes down. At once, Yeah. 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 And I think that there are I think that there are some shows that are and I, I'm not saying this about Bridgerton, but there are some shows that are not good. But if you watch it all at once, uh, they yeah. fool you into maybe thinking that they're good. Uh, and then there are other TV shows that are good. And so I <laughs> like it's like if Succession released all at once, I would have like thrown myself out a window because like getting to live in Succession world for right. like months and having everyone like talking about it every week was like I, I, it's. I, I feel like you are basically labeling your TV show as completely disposable if you release it in a day yeah. because no one is ever going to talk about it outside of the first three days. Yep, for sure. Uh, uh, Victor Jesus Moreno says, I found the ground to playing Control, and good lordy lord, this game is incredible. I know I'm late to the party, but good lordy lord, how good is this game? <laughs> I feel like Lord, it's good. uh, In terms of uh, trajectory after release, I feel like control has just increased, and everybody looks back on it more and more fondly now to be like, Jesus Christ, 2019 control. Did we not give that game enough love? Uh, But Haley, you just played it not too long ago, right? It's so good. It just makes you feel awesome, and then the levels all look so cool. The story's really cool. It's just it's just the opposite of Alan Wake, which was really fun. Where you're just in Alan Wake, you're this sniveling little writer. It's like ah, I'm slow and I can't run more than ten feet. <laughs> you need my flashlight and a gun. Uh, click click click. What's happening? And then you cut to control, and you're just like like using the force to absolutely slam people every time you get a new power. It it's really good and makes it the game even more fun somehow. You think, oh, they can't give me another power. This is perfect, and they give you something else. And you're like, yes, it's just so fun. <laughs> Uh, super mediocre man. Hey, Min Max. Uh, ben and Ronnie said that they were U2 fans on the deepest dive for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth after making a reference to the song Vertigo. As a fellow U2 appreciator, I have to ask, what is your favorite U2 song and why is U2 so controversial? 
I'm not really a YouTube fan. I would just, I just wanted to say Uno Dos Catorce. You would lie? <laughs> I know. You would I go know on you your own liar. podcast and lie about being a YouTube fan? I thought that fan? was clearly sarcasm coming through. The only reason that you said that is because that's the song that they start you talking you two to me, right? Oh, <laughs> like, maybe. I have listened to every episode of that podcast. Uh, so there is something really punchable about you two. And to be fair to you two, I, I do very sincerely like the song Beautiful Day. Like, if that song comes on the radio, I will blast it, and I'll give myself a beautiful day. Or their second greatest hit, uh, Freaks Like Me Need Company from Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. It's those two <laughs> tracks are oh, clearly the finest. They're, they're the ones who forced their album on yes. my iPhone. That's why no I hate one them. No will ever forget it. That was annoying. I just was like, I don't like you now, just because that happened. I think that they was were a, like in my shuffle, and I didn't, could you delete you guys, it? I, I still have it on my phone. Shuffle. No, I still get like, what is this song? Oh, it's a weird song about wolves from U2, and I, it's still on my phone for whatever reason. I, I think that is the turning point where it's like, all right, I know Bono's kind of a blowhard, and now he's invaded my, the privacy of my playlist. Yeah. And that's just like culturally. A very sacred thing. Yeah. Back then. That's right. It yeah. It was like 20 something teen. Yeah. I, don't I, I think it's like if you're a maybe specifically a rock band, because this isn't like a pop star thing, but it's like if you're a rock band and you're reaching for the largest possible audience, it is going to create a proportionally huge amount of people who hate you, you know, because it's like, <laughs> I don't know if I don't right. know if I would say, I mean, they they almost certainly did kind of sell out and however you would determine selling out. But they were just like, we're not content being beloved by some. We want to be, you know, we want to sell out d the biggest stadiums in the world. And they do. Uh, but that just means that, like, the equal and opposite reaction is like a lot of people really don't like them. Yep. Yep. No way. In are. the same way that like, I don't know, whatever stand up comedian is going to sell out like the biggest stadiums in the world is going to be yeah. kind of hated. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's so interesting that you say that because weren't they playing in the Las Vegas sphere? Mid Max. Yeah, and that show looks sick. I wish I saw it. I don't even like that. Yeah, Jeff Clark went to Wouldn't it. Wouldn't that make us all YouTube fans? Since it's our what is it greatest work of art? What did we? I guess the, if they Not did mine. touch the greatest Not work of art of all time, art. then maybe they became by proxy the greatest work of art of all time. Probably the greatest mm -hmm. band of all mm -hmm. time now. Officially, Min Max of stands. We don't have an official band, uh. but now it has to be you too. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> Sorry, Haley. No way out. Um, no. Ari Torben says, Ben, I saw that MinMax provided some footage for the story of the Oregon Trail video essay by the gaming historian on YouTube. Could you please tell us more about your involvement with the video, and will the gaming historian ever be a future MinMax guest? The video is amazing, and everyone should watch it, by the way. Um, yeah, that was a fun surprise, um, where, um, Jacob, help me, I forget their name, the gaming historian, man, um, he reached out, and he's like, hey, I watched your documentary of the Oregon Trail that MinMax produced, and there's a bunch of footage in there that I want to use. Can I use it? Um, and like, you know, it's one of those like, hey, what, what terms would you agree to? Haley, you should have been in this email. It was perfect. Um, and it was like, I, can you just put our name on the screen? Time, man. I should have. I was like, just put our name on the screen. We're using the footage and I don't really care. And he's like, ah, I don't really like doing that. I don't like having the name on the screen. And I was like, ah, uh, okay. Then it was like, do I try and negotiate a price for this old footage that's just sitting on a hard drive? And I was like, that's stupid. And I think back when I first started filming this documentary back in 2009, I used like the TV station's equipment and I told them that I wouldn't make a profit off it. So I was like, you know, just tweet, a, tweet out MinMax's YouTube channel when the documentary goes live and we're even. <laughs> and so that was it. Uh, but now I see that the documentary has like 300,000 views on YouTube and it's just killing it. Uh, you didn't even uh, get us in the Caruso. about? Um, I think we're in the description. Yeah, thank you, Jacob okay. Keller Norman. Yeah, I think we're in the description as a thank you, which is... Everyone that checks those. Right. We're get we so we had clicks. two comments <laughs> You on... know what? You have your own separate paragraph that says a special thank you to MinMax yeah, for providing at that. some footage That's for lovely. this documentary. That's lovely. Yeah, zero hard feelings. I love it. Um, it's because again, that footage is just sitting around. That's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, we had two comments on our Oregon Trail documentary about like, Gaming Historian sent me. I was like, all right, well, there we go. That's that's the win right there, I suppose. I'll take it. Um, Preetham Yar Legata says, hello, everybody. Better Quest update. I think about the fact that Ben created a friendship survey on an episode at least once a week. The amount of vulnerability to write those questions and send those out to your friends astounds me. My question is, did the, that survey, survey meaning, meaningfully affect how you interact with people? And would the other cohorts ever consider sending a friendship survey to all their friends on how they can improve themselves? 
Ben loves surveys, you guys. Like every <laughs> week, there's like a data. poll on the Twitter feed. Uh-huh. Like the Patreon, just a bunch of polls. Like I mean, last Ben last loves year at the polls. end of the year. Didn't didn't people assign each of us like a number rating? Yeah. What? Like what? Was it when you did that big year end survey? Wasn't it like no. who's your favorite cohort? No, 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 no. I think that'd be fascinating, but no, we didn't do that. No, 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 no. I, I thought, like, okay, now I thought that you, you mentioned had it, that though, information. I will write that down for next year's survey. <laughs> Wait, Jacob, what'd you say? I said I thought you had that information and you just chose not to tell us. Oh because it'd make us no, go crazy. no, that'd be too twisted. I mean, I would love to see that ranking. I think it'd be fascinating, but no, you couldn't do that. That'd be too messed up and, and uh, debaucherous. Be messed up. Yeah, I went back and looked at that survey after seeing this question. It's like that was. That was raw. That was weird. Um, Because, like, I sent it to maybe, like, 30 people, and there are a couple, like, outlier answers that still... I I wasn't annoyed by it, but then I went back and checked it again. Like, who was this person? Like, you know, it's like... Because one of the questions was, like, does Ben seem like a happy person? And one person said no. I was like, that's... You asked that? Yeah. I was like, that's... Jesus! Wouldn't you want to know, Sarah, and people... What is that no, oh, I would have wanted to know. Okay, good. I don't know. I'm just curious. I'm just curious New how it goes. Show Plus, you input that data into Excel and learn how to make pivot tables and, and <laughs> compile mm. stuff about yourself. Okay. Uh, people are asking, did Sarah get the survey? Sarah, did I send you that survey? Are you the person who answered all negative? No, I do not okay. believe you sent me that survey. Okay, good. I'll send it to you now. Uh, but it's anonymous. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, see how Ben the loves change. surveys but hates Excel. Like, it, make it make sense, Ben. Yeah. Well, it, where when, are you putting this data? I he love, wants to collect it and never use Yeah, I love <laughs> surveys, but I hate math. And Excel feels like homework. I don't know what's going on there. Um, sincerely, Eric writes in and says, Hello, dear friends and lovely faces. Um, sort of a better quest victory segued into a question. I've never had any problems created by or caused from drinking, but I did finally have to admit to myself... Uh, and for myself that I had a drinking problem. I cannot tell you the last night I went in years without at least one drink, but more times than not, it was more than that. With a great struggle, I was finally able to go my first day without drinking a few weeks ago, Uh, and honestly, it was all thanks to Alan Carr's Easy Way to Quit Drinking book and his Easy Way method. So with a book that helped me have a new year ahead of me and sober living, I actually uh, dove into reading more than any other year. Yeah, it's tough to read when you're drunk, so way to go, Eric. Um, they say, besides the panels... Also, great job. <laughs> also, yeah, also, yeah, also, also, great job. That's true. Uh, besides the panels and other computer-loving cohorts, lovely works of writing, do you all have any good book recommendations? I, I don't have good, like, self-help book recommendations. Sure. But he's just reading everything. I think he's reading in general, yeah. Um, read uh, the book Underland by Robert McFarlane, which is all about caves and is somehow the most beautiful book ever written um and also read the memoir priest daddy by patricia lockwood which is uh just a um a memoir written by a woman who's not particularly notable except for being a really good writer but like my god what a book right on love it i just thought of one actually i read it in law school and i think about it all the time it's called getting to yes um and it the way this book looks it looks like like a jerk dude wrote it <laughs> he's giving you like dating advice or something but it's it's about interest-based negotiation and the reason we read in law school is to be better negotiators but it honestly changes the way that i like get into fights with my little sister now or like think of other people's perspective in, when i don't like what they're saying to me and stuff like it, it kind of rewired my brain a little bit in that way like whenever like the common thing that this book kind of came up with is like interest-based negotiation is if two people want to split an orange um, and then they cut it down the middle and they're both upset. But in reality, if they just talked about it more, one wanted the peel and one wanted the fruit and they both could have walked away happy, but they just didn't talk about what their interests were mm. in the negotiation. They just said, I want half an orange. That's like the most basic way of thinking about it. But it delves into how humans negotiate with each other and like the best way to do that. That's right. What's the name of that again? Yeah. Getting to yes. Getting to yes. Uh, Dingus 2K says, hey, y'all. Out of all the alien-related media... Oh, by the way, Eric, uh, write in um, whenever you want. But if you hit a year on sobriety, write in again, and we'll shower you with more praise than you could possibly imagine. Please. Congratulations. Uh, Dingus2k writes in and says, Hey, y'all. Out of all the alien-related media you've experienced, which one seems to most accurately represent your idea of a real alien? Uh, This is only about real aliens, everybody. So what what media do you think gets it the most right? E.T., probably? Ew. <laughs> well, I agree with you. like a turd. No, I think... Ew. <laughs> I'm very much in the camp of all this alien stuff. Um, we're not thinking wildly enough. 
like I think the the idea that aliens are going to be like a hazy mist is all we can detect. Like I think that's that, very Futurama. Like that's oh, what really? I was just thinking. There's a bunch of aliens that are just ethereal clouds. Yeah, that, that are just like hello, and then like just move away. That feels like that. right. Probably is what they are. Like I always think of the fact that you know we think that aliens are going to be like gray humans with big eyes like what kind of narcissistic vantage point it's excuse like, you they're called the grays i'm sorry all respect to the grays out there and the, the skeetar and everybody else from perfect dark um but it's like i always just think about the fact that when we're trying to communicate with aliens or talk about communicating with aliens it's like okay try to communicate with a jellyfish because we're going to have a lot more in common with a jellyfish because we both came from planet earth than we will with an alien jacob's jacob swinson oh i'm I, I think that there, there are kind of two things that are going to happen, which is that alien and then sophisticated enough to move through the universe far enough sure. to get to us. And I actually think that that is going to be maybe the bigger barrier because I, I kind of think it's going to be something with a physical body. Like gravity works the same in most places. Sure, they could have come from like a, a planet with a weird atmosphere or something, but yeah. like... I think it's going to have a body, but I think the transcended so highly and kind of wanting to treat us as a less evolved thing, it'll kind of be like contact where they like put us in like a simulation where it's like, well, they will understand this, but they'll be like so tech brained that they'll be able to kind of like create worlds for us to communicate with them through is is my. I'm still fingers crossed. They're really hot. Mm, wouldn't that Fingers be sweet? Because aliens are hot, and yeah. we're are, like Thane from Mass Effect. That's not hot enough, as we learned from Thirst Council. We need like genuine, just Sephiroth aliens, or what? I mean, like, what if they have like a great personality though? They won't. Mm. What if, like if the if the like <laughs> aliens from Arrival had a great personality? Would that be good? Like the big <laughs> the big octopus thing. Shirt in the words, Chris. If that I think in terms of like the media that seems the most accurate, I do think Arrival is maybe my number one for just like weird tentacle things. And it's a real challenge to even get to the basics of communicating with them. Uh, I was thinking about Arrival the other day because I think about it most days. But is there some framework for this type of scene in a movie where they just like take a detour to teach you something? Like I think about that scene in Arrival where it's like, okay, you want to communicate with aliens? Here's a simple sentence. Jacob, maybe you remember. Like what is the sentence that they say again? Oh, yeah. Like take me to your leader or something. Just something like very basic. Where, sure. Like, where did yeah, you come something from? Like something like that. Like, okay, let's put it on a chalkboard. Let's break down everything we have to teach them to get to just this very basic sentence. And I love that when movies are just like, all right, pause, educational detour, and it's always compelling, I feel like. But maybe just for dorks, I don't know. But, like, I guess here's the thing about, like, real aliens. Yeah. Real, quote, unquote. Not really real, but it's, like, all the written things about aliens is they keep, like, flying in and, like, talking to... Like poor people, children, people who have no political power, right? right? They're not right. like they're like save the earth. You're gonna. Blah, blah, blah. They're not talking to the president. They're talking to a bunch of school children who like. What are they gonna do? Nothing. What are the people in the car gonna do that you just freaked out? Nothing. Yeah, but could you find? Sorry, like, get it together, aliens. Could you find like a queen ant if you really wanted to, Sarah? Yeah, it's a yeah. big one, right? Maybe I guess that's a terrible. The president analogy. must be the biggest in human. the basement. <laughs> 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 I think that's how it works. Yeah. Um, Adam Cohen writes in, and I I like this question. I don't care what anybody else says, Adam. I'm with you. They ask, is the lightsaber the most recognizable movie object ever? Adam says, I can't think of anything else that comes close. So most recognizable movie object. It's a good thinker. Cinderella's glass slipper. Like, come on, you f- like the ruby Sorry. slipper. From come on, you sci-fi Oz. losers. Come on. I sincerely was thinking ruby red slippers from Wizard of Oz. But yeah, like any. Uh, I, like- I, I think lightsaber would beat it. Yeah, at I this think so point. Too, I mean, though. Wizard really? of Oz is 80 years old. Think about like Gen Alpha. Like, yeah, just, just think about kids. They don't know yeah. anything. But what, they know lightsabers. what about this? Sarah, you were so close. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this today. And I think I'm correct. And it cannot be disproven. It's Rosebud, everybody. The Sims uses it. No. Um, no, but sincerely, what about Cinderella's castle? Mm. Because it's also the Walt Disney Disney logo. logo. Oh, yeah. I think that might be number one for object. I guess, would you need people, would you be satisfied if people just said Disney Disney logo? logo? Yeah. Because I don't think people, I think, I think there are a lot of people who wouldn't identify it as Cinderella's castle, but they would just know, like, that's from Disney. They just need to know the name of it. And they couldn't say laser sword for lightsaber. It's like logo feels like cheating. 
Yeah, but it's like a... It's a logo that's from a movie. Yeah, uh, yeah Luxo Jr. from <laughs> Pixar. Um, is that an object? Pride Rock? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of like, no the most way. profitable movies of all time and like what the iconic imagery is. Des- I mean, like Spider-Man's face mask. You know, like Ooh, it, I feel like it would be yeah. another because it's like I think Spider-Man is like probably one of the most recognizable characters in the world. But I a do Pokeball. still think a, a lightsaber would beat mm-hmm. it. Yeah, but but both, both those like Pokeball and Mask, like those originated somewhere else. Like, it does, should it be a proper movie creation that feels more pure? I, I think Death Star is more recognizable than a lightsaber, wouldn't you think? Especially no. what lightsaber show it a lot movies. in the modern movies. What about a turn? My mom off would say lightsaber? that's a lightsaber, and she'd see the Death Star and be like, "A moon planet." Like she would not know what the. I say Star that's is. no moon. Yeah, give me her number because I need to tell her that that's not a moon. Um, okay, let us know in the comments what the most recognizable thing is. Uh, Flash's helmet <laughs> says Carlos. God damn it! Don't do it. Don't bring up the Flash again. Uh, Graham Walker writes in and says, "Okay, fun game to see if you can beat me. Who lives closest to the most famous person?" You have to weigh distance and fame to decide a winner. And Graham asks, can anyone beat me? I live within 14 miles of Ed Sheeran. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's that's a, a tough one. one. That's a tough one to top. <sighs> I think, uh, I think, uh, why, why can't I remember his name? The Fortnite, the guy who owns Epic. Oh, Tim Sweeney. Tim Sweeney has a house in Rome. Oh. Did OBS crash? Oh. I guess I'm not by myself. I guess I'll talk to myself. Am I online? Okay, well, I guess my internet decided to uh, crap the bed, but I think he was going to say that Tim Sweeney lived in Raleigh. Okay, welcome. A miniature version of everybody from the Minac Show. Welcome. Calling uh, without an internet signal needed over 4G. Um, what did you guys like for question of the week? <laughs> I liked the thousand people and you have to win or yeah. your gets cut off. <laughs> yeah. We added as a bonus. We added that in. <laughs> also aliens, but I'm fine with the thousand people. Jacob, I also was an alien man myself, but I think thousand people is going to be the way to go. So congratulations to Sean Rubin. You won the prize from I am 8-Bit. Greatly appreciate it. Um, do you guys want me to wrap up the rest of the show myself? Does anybody have a killer get a load of this they want to share? Uh, venture from Overwatch, new characters from... Where I live. Wow. I know. Canada? Nova Scotia, Canada. Oh. No characters ever from here. <laughs> That's Yippee. great. That's great. Uh, but unfortunately, you forgot to say get a load of this, and we didn't play the jingle, so I don't know if that counts, Haley, oh, um, for an official. Wow. what I just said. We just <laughs> had a mini version of the Dragon's Dogma 2 spoiler cast, too, while you were gone. What? You can't do that without us? we got to get that on air. It was yeah, really it good, wasn't too. Recorded. It was really good. God damn it. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll do the rest by myself then and wrap this whole thing up. But uh, thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> Don't worry. Have fun. Let's go. <laughs> Bye. But hey, that's it for this episode of the MinMax Show podcast. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening to this uh, wild ride. We'll see if we're going to use this ending. Part of me desperately hopes we won't. Um, but. We have a lot of stuff coming up here at MinMax. First and foremost, uh, Trivia Tower coming up Monday, April 22nd. If you want to support independent games media, you can jump in at even the $2 tier and compete in game trivia this Monday, April 22nd. Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb is going to be co-hosting it. You can win a code for Prince of Persia, for Yellow Taxi Goes Room, for Death of a Wish, which is a game we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, So jump in there, compete in game trivia, give yourself an exciting monday evening you'll enjoy it i promise also just a reminder we're having the big community meetup this september and you can make your pitch for your hometown on patreon if you jump in at any tier as well we're looking forward to going through all of those also spiciest interview rolls on uh this week it was dan reichert and myself interviewing each other um for spiciest interview from the minmax studio and it was a fun wild ride and I had way too much of the bomb. It was brutal. Um, also, we wrapped up now the deepest dive on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. We ended up talking about that game for 23 hours. I think technically over 23 hours. Um, if you include the Patreon exclusive stuff, which had bonus spoiler discussions a couple times throughout that run. 
but five episodes, it was, don't tell anybody this because it's just me, I guess, but um, it was my favorite deepest dive I've ever done. I had such a good time with that discussion. So if you enjoy that type of in-depth and hopefully fun discussion, uh, we could use your support because it's an odd thing to do with an outlet, uh, but it only exists because of you supporting it and unlocking the podcast version of that. If you want to unlock the podcast version of that five-part game club discussion right in the same podcast app where you're listening to this, you can go to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends, jump in at that $5 tier, and you can unlock that podcast version of that. Also, shout out on our YouTube channel. We have a video, a new video going up, uh, a new video up now, which is Haley and Leo role-playing Red Dead Redemption 2. It is those two playing Red Dead Redemption 2, um, and they've been doing it for a while. This is the second video we've put on Minmax's channel, but they're role-playing as actors in that game on like a role-playing server. It is the most charming, sweetest damn video I've ever sweet seen. Like they put on a stage play in St. Denis at the end of it, and it's like a big performance, and they are genuinely nervous like they're actually putting on this theatrical production, which they kind of are. And there's like an actual crowd that shows up that's confused about what's happening, and they're like, hey, folks, welcome to the show. Like seeing Leo in particular get so excited about putting on that stage show in Red Dead Redemption 2, it's the sweetest damn thing. So that's on Min Max's YouTube channel. And we want to thank everybody who's at the Game Champion tier, the $50 tier. You can join that tier, choose any game under the sun. We'll declare you the champion. So special shout out to Secret Hollow. Its champion, of course, is Manifest Echo. PrettyGoodPrinting.com. They're the champion of Unreal Tournament Game of the Year Edition. Kyle Silva is the champion of Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright, colon, Ace Attorney. And that's it. Uh, we're really gersmaning it up in the last run here so it's bizarre to record a podcast by yourself but of course thank you so much everybody for watching thank you everybody for listening next week on the min max show we'll have everybody back they'll all be here i swear and it'll be a fun finale for the episode but if you stuck with it for this long thanks so much we'll see you next week be good have fun let's go mm -hmm.